Brian's going to uh, talk to us today uh, about a topic that I'm sure we're all thinking about, which is how the heck do you keep your hotel from being a cesspool of COVID-19? Um, Brian, <laughs> Brian uh, is a, a longtime friend of mine. Uh, I'm sorry, has, Brian. <laughs> yeah, which means he has no standards yeah. whatsoever. Exactly. Um, but uh, wait a second, we met you. Wait a second. <laughs> he specializes in um, remediation. Uh, so Recromax is the type of company you hire if your house is caught on fire and you don't want it to be, you know, smoky and gross or moldy. Uh, and they they clean up some horrible stuff. And so I thought it would be interesting. Uh, to have them talk about what they're doing for commercial spaces and hotels uh, in how do you get a hotel ready? And so he was um, foolish enough to say that he would come on the show. And so <laughs> we get to we get to talk about cleaning. Hey, Brian, I had a question. Did you meet Ed when you were hired to clean the blood stains from his basement? <laughs> 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 uh, those things were gone already when I got there, so we were okay. Yeah. It was more it was residual, like so the black light wouldn't see it. You know, <laughs> exactly. It was either did he hire you or did you find him? Like, did he give you a gold him? coin? Did he give you a gold <laughs> coin? <laughs> yeah, he yeah. yeah, got called yeah. to have some mess, guys. Lifted up this dirty rag, and there was a naked. <laughs> 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 and we've just been friends ever since. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's learned never to ask what's in the box. (laughs) (laughs) So so with that, uh, you know, um, you know, Ben and Tristan got to see last week that we are only polite to you for the first 30 minutes of the show. Uh, So so with that, um, you know, you have the first 30 minutes, you have the floor. So why don't you uh, talk to us about what you're doing? All right, so I would you know, jump in anytime you have any questions or any comments or you guys want to add, add to it. I'm, I'm trying Here to have some echo going on. Can you guys hear that? Echo? Yeah, yeah, I hear an echo too. It started when, um, when, when Tristan joined. came on. Yeah. yeah. No. Is it me? Yeah. I think it was me. All right, go ahead, Brian. Hey, hey it's in Peter. Hey. So, like Ed mentioned before, I, I, I run a restoration company, and you might say, what the heck does that have to do with disinfecting and cleaning? Um, on a daily basis, we clean up behind fires, uh, we clean up mold jobs, and we clean up Category 3 water losses, which is when your sewage backs up and we have poop cleanup, up, uh, which is a pretty serious uh, cleanup in that industry. So when this all happened, some of our clients came to us and said, would you guys get into disinfecting our buildings once we were ready to open up for business? Um, and we decided that we were going to take a look at it before we said yes. And after studying it for some time, we found out that our process in cleaning mold, fire, and poop is the same process that we would be using to clean up uh dis- and disinfect buildings. Um, so at that point, we decided we would tell our clients, yes, we will do your disinfecting, but we took our team and we had them um, go through a a seminar from the Cleaning Industry Research Institute on how to properly disinfect the building uh, as per CDC guidelines. And uh, so we went through that training and we've done some cleaning now, And but we're at the phase where I'm in Florida and we're at the phase that we're starting to open up and take a look at how we open up buildings and, and what we do from there. So I will talk more about the conversations we had with hotels and the planning we're starting to do. Um, most of them are not open for business right now, but uh, on the first we're opening up and as Disney and Universal opens up, they're more open up every day. The conversation is that my building can sit empty for a month and everything I read, the virus is dead at this point, so I should be safe. And that theoretically is, is the case. In most cases, and it should are probably okay. Um, but if you want to ensure that you're going to be safe, and secondly, most of them want to use a marketing campaign that shows that what they've done to their building had a third party come in and ensure that it has been clean and disinfected prior to opening. So that's where we're at, and we're putting some plans together with um, many hotels uh, to get to that process. And so what I will talk about today is some of the process. So I want to get 
too scientific or in deep into the details um, and talk about some of the things and issues that we may see coming up. And then at the end, um, although I would love for hotels to hire Reformat every day to disinfect their structures, I know that that's not in the budget. And uh, I will have some ideas that we could go through and at that point. That's great. Um, I'd like to point out that every time you said the word poop, every single host <laughs> smiled and laughed. So, you know, it's, a word. Word. it's a magic <laughs> word. That's the maturity level you're dealing with. Yeah, that, that, that is the maturity high level. Edition of. And the, when you said, you know, it backs up, it's a major emergency. I think every father in the in, in the room was like, We've all been there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian, where were you in the first six months? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the life of my children is all I can say because there was no price. My sleep deprived my will of pay. <laughs> so, 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 Brian, um, you know, kind of talking to uh, the the process that you all look at uh, when you're looking at a building. Um, what are what are some of the you know kind of big points that you look at uh, to to focus on? So when we get to that point of looking at the building, we look at how we're going to do it. Um, obviously, the number of rooms and the area. So the thing we want to do is how are we going to coordinate this disinfecting process? Uh, obviously, we want to clean things that are used less frequently at this time, which would be rooms first and then move over to common spaces, all the way down to your lobbies and everything at that point. So um, A, how we can get people in there, how quickly we do it work around 24 hours around the clock, um, keep moving. Um, and in addition, hotels are a special breed because you already have your own cleaning staff. Um, we go to a, a restaurant or another business, they, are, they don't have that, so we have to do full service clean, it's a two-part process. Um, but when we're looking at hotels, I'm looking at lowering the cost while implementing some of your cleaning staff in the process of doing it. Um, there are things out there now, I say, buyer beware. Uh, I live in Florida. Every time we have a hurricane, we hear on the news all the time about price gouging and everybody coming in and trying to help everybody out that isn't an expert. And you always hear this horror story. So there are really three things that I'd say, buyer beware. Um, Bloomberg Business Week did an article that said um, you can pay anywhere from a dollar to $10 a square foot for the disinfecting process. Uh, which is a absurd cost at this point. And maybe even some metropolitan areas in New York City is higher than it is in Florida. That is, a, that is a huge burden that I know that nobody has in their budget to do this. We're looking at anywhere from 35 cents to 65 cents. You lower depending on uh, how big and how um, dense the, the structure is. The other thing is in Florida alone, over 100 companies uh, started their business in the last month to name disinfectant. So you have every brother uh, that has ever cleaned uh, their kitchen table and now become a disinfecting expert. I actually heard a elevator door company now add disinfecting uh, to their service. So obviously there's opportunists that are out there to uh, make a buck on it, which is great. Uh, but you also have to make sure that they're reliable um, and that you're getting actual disinfecting process done in the structure. So um, you mean you, you mean hotels should be weary of someone who comes in with a flamethrower pack and says, yeah, I'll disinfect everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's very close to the, what they're saying with the foggers. They're going to come in, they're going to fog everything, you're going to automatically be disinfected. So that, as per the CPC, is not getting you disinfected. And you're just paying money, even if it's a little bit less than the, than what Bloomberg says. You're still not getting what you're you're paying for at that point. Brian, you know, not to put you on the spot, but you know, can you talk a little bit about is there certification or indemnification or how that works? You know, in terms of uh, so what the, happens there, right? So there are certifications in in my restoration industry, IIRC, that has certifications for this process. Uh, we also sent our um, technicians through the in industry cleaning um, institute uh, to get a, get it um, guarantees and making sure that nobody gets COVID. Uh, that is something that is very hard to guarantee and protect. 
at the end of this, I'll mention some testing. There are some tests that you can do on structures to see if you have any COVID in there. Unfortunate part about it is it's very expensive and you have to test every single surface in order for you to give a guarantee that it isn't there. I could see four feet of my desk over here and that can show up clean and the other four foot uh, is actually where the virus is. So I don't believe there's anybody out there that can actually give you a true guarantee over there. Um, so as per CDC guidelines, there there is a two-step process. You have to clean it, and then you have to disinfect it, okay? So if I were going into a hotel, we'll go through a quick process of it. I would go first meet with management and plot out the areas we're going to work and plot out areas how we can control access. The next thing um, I would do... Sorry. I'm sorry, Rory from... Uh... Oh, I didn't say where he's from. Uh, asking about ozonator, o ozonators. So ozone machines. So ozones uh, do not clean and disinfect buildings. Ozones will take away smell. Uh, and there are actually some ozone machines that have ultraviolet that will help scrub air. So if it goes through there, it could kill the bacteria. If you heard some press conferences um, a couple weeks ago, they talked about light um, on your body and in it. But also on surfaces um, that could kill the bacteria, uh, and that is true. But um, an ozone machine alone does not just pretty much kill. So to get rid and disinfect the building, a two-step process: get the clean and disinfect. So next thing I would do in a hotel is coordinate with the cleaning staff to remove all soft goods from the room: the, the curtains, the bedding, the uh, towels, and you have them laundered in your own laundry services at that point. The next thing I do to reduce cost is have them do the clean. A clean is just done by a cleaning agent. It could be Dawn, it could be Pine Sol. But what that does, it removes the biofilm from any hard surface. It cleans it. I'm sorry, clean. you, you use the word biofilm. Could you uh, talk <laughs> a little bit about <laughs> biofilm? <laughs> Biofilm is the layer on top of any surface that, that collects and holds um, your germs and any dirt. Okay, oh. so that's that's anything that the layer on top of the surface. I'm, I'm, I don't know how to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that first thing process would have to clean it and get most of the particles off of it. After that, I would have them come back with the soft goods, since it's that staff, soft goods back in place. And then we would come in and do a disinfecting. Uh, we would use a, a, a clogger, which would clog disinfectant onto the hard surfaces. Key points here is you have to let it dwell for 10 minutes, sit on there, kill the um, bacteria that's on there, and then you wipe it off and clean it. Um, so that's a very important step. Uh, not just cleaning it, but the disinfectant kills the germs and the viruses on the surface. Um, if I'm doing a large structure, I would, at that point, close and seal off that area. It has been cleaned and disinfected. Part of the, the assurances that you asked about earlier, and um, also what you can be so confident about is you need to do some testing in those areas. And, Whenever I talk with a commercial customer, we talk about how much testing we're going to do and how random we're going to do it. So if some of the hotels already have restaurants, they may, may already have ATP testers. And what those do, they test the bacteria on the surface. The little handheld devices, uh, you, you get swabs and you swab different surfaces and you enter them into a handheld device and immediately you'll get a reading. And a reading of 10 or below on there means that that's that surface is sufficient. Anything above would mean we have to go back and reclean the area. Now, this this product, which I would recommend uh, any commercial building that's going to have to do this and prove it, get um, has a, has a program with it as well that tracks and keeps all the data of all the cleaning and all the testing that you've done uh, in there. So this is something that if anybody came in. You can show this is what we do, this is how we test, and this is how we validate what we're doing and cleaning. Um, hey, Brian, then I would, do, you, do you do home visits? 
because I'm fairly certain my kids' rooms are going to be like... <laughs> it's a pretty be, thick. If you do that chart thing, if you say it's going to be below 10, man, it's going to be like 1,010. It's, yeah. it's a pretty thick biofilm, you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's, my it's college house would never have gotten, um, never gotten below 200, probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we get through some of that, yes. We could be there. Where are you at? Yeah, England. Just uh, jump on the next plane. So it's perfect, Brian. <laughs> it's easy for you. Yeah, hop <laughs> over the next plane and get over there. Across the pond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this this isn't rocket science. It's a lot of detail and paying attention to what needs to be done. Um, so what we're doing is providing the companies that we do this, the data that we get from the testing and the test results, and show them how, A, randomly that is picked, because you can't have the same person as cleaning testing go and test the that he cleaned um, and show them how we did it, how we tested it. And then I would seal off the areas that we did. If it's a larger hotel, I would start on the top floor, clean the rooms, have them tested, um, put um, some safety tape on there that shows that if you break the tape, uh, that that room has now been breached and and could be, uh, you know, breached and have during the stuff entered into the room again. And then so, I would go down into the common area. Go ahead. Yeah, or people, we call them. Yeah. A quick, quick question. You know, when we first saw this rolling through China and so forth, they were running around with foggers and sprayers and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And, and any real effect to it? Is it just put a coating on top of what's already there? What was all that kind of fogging so, stuff? It does kill something uh, that's there. As I think Italy was spraying their streets down and, and going through it. Um, but there has to be a cleaning process. So they should have cleaned whatever they were spraying first with foggers. Uh, we're using uh, foggers as well. Uh, but there has to be a, a cleaning process that's added into that. So if they would have came, uh, they were doing the streets in Italy, they came and gone through the streets, sweeper and cleaner and detergent on it, that would have helped, and then spray it down. Um, that would have been definitely a better process. Okay, and I've also heard about uh, low pH water, acidic water, being a, a cleaning agent, or is that is it, just something that's hyped up? I never heard of that. Uh, no, I, I never heard that to be the case. So, so let me, uh, you know, let's let's kind of turn this to something that could be helpful for our marketing audience. So, you know, one of the challenges marketers are going to have in this is talking about the steps they've taken without it sounding like we were discussing before. So, you know, it, and it sounds like uh, the key difference here is not so much a question of cleanliness, but a question of disinfecting. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between something that's been cleaned versus something that's been, you know, correctly disinfected? So the first part is the cleaning process that I talk about, which is probably the normal process that every hotel does in every room. They, they go through with a, a cleaning agent and they clean the surfaces um, and they get 80 90 percent of the virus and the germs off the surface at that point they get the bio the, the biofilm cleaned off what they don't do is go through now we're talking about a specific virus and something that is a pandemic what they don't do is kill all the germs in the area 100 percent and that's the extra step going forward they would have to do, I would imagine, they have on both cars, they'd have a clean agent, they would have a disinfectant, and go in there and be, do the room basically after they clean it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I would think for most people too, because you, you focused on the, the first step of disinfecting the whole thing and being rigorous in that, but as soon as that first guest or first housekeeper goes into that room and makes the bed, it, it's now exposed. So I think I think providing reassurance to the guest is all about what are your processes and procedures. So are you are you helping folks with that as well? I was having so a conversation with, with. Go ahead, yeah, and then I'll so, have a follow up question. So we are talking about them. There's four things that uh, we've talked to them about, and I've done some research and saw some uh, actually larger chains doing similar things. But a, if it doesn't change your, your function or doesn't change your design. Reducing the amount of things that are in areas in, such as magazines, furniture, and, and lamps, anything that could the virus could dwell on and sit on and have additional uh, wires. Two, they would have to do the two-step cleaning every time that we talk about. So, like I said, when the 
housekeeper goes and does the first cleaning, makes the bed, does the wipe down, they're going to have to go through there and do the disinfectant every single time. So it's an additional step in there. Uh, three, have the manager do random testing so that they can show their public that not only are we cleaning, but checking behind ourselves to make sure what we're saying we're doing is correct and by those results if fast. Um, and then four is the controlled access. So I saw that some hotels are doing similar to what I was talking about with the safety tape is once the room is clean, the next person that goes in is going to be um, the traveler and it's actually going to break the seal of the room so they know they're going in. So um, another question from uh, Vori was about the uh, day delay stuff where, um, you know, where hotels are potentially considering that you, you don't reserve or re reuse the room for a day going back in. Is there any benefit to that or anything that is advantageous for that? So from what I read, uh, this virus can sit on uh, materials for up to 14 days. So, uh, and some, uh, you know, most of it's three days. Uh, so there's, I wouldn't say there's really big any advantage if you don't do the cleaning disinfecting. Another so, question. I'm sorry. So just, just real quick, uh, rental yeah. uh, rental owners, uh, they said, do you envision potentially cleaning fees at hotels? I, I guess that's a, just a general question. Do 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 people envision cleaning fees coming into the process like we had resort fees? That there's a no, 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 no. Don't charge guests for a clean room. Okay. No. I'm, how about discounts for dirty rooms? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's I'm just saying. Well, it's not just well lower ADR. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh no, 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 no! You, you. One of the things that's going to cause travel to come back when it comes back is that people are going to feel confident that they can travel. Anything that puts doubt in their mind that they shouldn't travel, like the fact that you know the 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 room isn't clean is you know going to be actually a bigger harm than it is a benefit now louis boucher is saying you know low-cost hotels in europe charge for daily housekeeping totally different thing if you're saying daily housekeeping for you know a guest who's in a room are we going to come in and clean that room while you're there every day but a different thing altogether when we're talking about you know and mm. so so um brian just help us out on the the disinfecting fogging i mean it, even if a hotelier wanted to train their staff to do this every time they turn a room, um, what kind of wear and tear does that put on the materials? I mean, I have to imagine something that's powerful enough to kill any remnants of living organism is likely going to speed up wear and tear on the materials of the room. I mean, how harsh are these uh, chemicals? So I, I don't know the real total long-term effect on it. Um, I believe that it would start to break down over a period of time, but it isn't something that's going to be any time within uh, a year or so of daily cleaning. Now, when I say fogging, is I'm using a fogger to do mass distribution of the disinfectant. So when we're doing a cleaning, the reason I'm using a fogger is because it helps distribute the material quicker and has a better coverage of the surface. When and when I would imagine a hotel staff doing it, they would use a bottle, a spray bottle with a disinfectant in it and spray down the item instead of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have you seen <clears throat> recently there's been some chemical companies coming out saying that they've created uh, chemicals that will actually keep the surface uh, free of COVID for up to a certain amount of time afterwards? Um, have you seen any of those? Have you looked at any of those? And do you think that's uh, even realistic? From what the CDC and what we're building our our process off of, I don't believe that that's the case. I, I haven't seen it. Or... Okay. No, from, from back in my days of GMing a hotel, we had cleaning and then we had deep cleaning. And the deep cleaning was the high dust and it was the places that were least likely to be touched and so forth. So there's a progression of cleaning that a room always went through. There's a scheduling that the rooms went through between the daily cleaning usage of it and versus the we're going to go over and do deep cleaning in this room and have that process. Do you feel with the current concerns and so forth that that scheduling or the terms of what each mean should change? Like you should be looking at deep cleaning the room persistently at this point where you really are doing a lot more of the non-contact surfaces or the hidden surfaces simply to alleviate the potential of the of the virus being in the room 
So there's been some question of do they have to disinfect every day or every, every travel? But the fact is, anybody that goes in there can bring in the virus with them at this point. Now, the, the hard to reach areas, the areas that are in high traffic, I don't believe are the highest priority. I think every day, the hard services, the desks, the TV remotes, um, the doorknobs, the light switches, the HVAC controls, um, the beds, everything that you touch on a daily basis needs to be protected. But the deep thing you're talking about that's the hidden dust or the high reach areas, I don't think is the highest priority. And so speaking of HVAC, I mean, do you recommend as like a building that's going through trying to ensure that they've uh, correctly disinfected the area? Should they be doing anything to their HVAC systems, you think? So when I don't really know the, the result of that. I think HEPA filters are always a, a great addition to HVAC systems to prevent anything from dust, allergies, and to prevent some of the transmission of the virus. When we do our initial cleaning, we put the building under negative air pressure with air scrubbers to um, protect other areas from being infected so that we're controlling where the, where the clean areas are and are not. So um, I would think that HEPA filters are always a situation. Now, I don't know how you do the little rooms that have individual ACs under, under the windows. Um, speaking of negative air pressure being effective in this, you know, something Lauren and I have talked about on previous episodes is the idea of the highest risk part of a hotel uh, for transmission would be the elevators. And so one of the thoughts we had was um, keeping the elevators under negative air pressure. Um, how difficult would you think something like that would be in your opinion? Because, you know, I'm sure you haven't thought about that. So, I, I haven't thought about that, but I don't think actually it would be that all that difficult. There would be there's the air filters, air scrubbers that um, suck the air out of an area. I think those can, I'm sure they make ones that can be retrofitted to an elevator uh, to create that space. We're almost there, Lauren. We now have a professional telling us maybe. So, so as far as I'm concerned, that's that's a yes. That's a yes. You, you 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 a yes. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. So you, ever, you ever go into a large commercial building and you open that door and you feel that air gust going down in front of you? They're creating a film there with the HVAC system to prevent hot air or cold air from moving. That would be a similar process you could have with uh, the elevator. Well, that's a different film to a biofilm. Yes. So just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the sequel to that film. <laughs> it actually blows the biofilm off of you. <laughs> so, so back to something earlier you mentioned, Brian, about the uh, the UV and stuff like that. You know, the hospitals have that machine they've had for a while, and I'm sure they're getting more of them. Where they roll it into the middle of the room and high dose the UV into the room to it doesn't hit everything, but it hits whatever surface the light hits. I guess is that a viable solution that hotels can go over and roll this little creature into the middle of the room, go and then think that it's going to hit most of the stuff or that does, that scrubs the air that cleans Just the, the air, air more than the surface. Yeah. So they are looking at lights that you can a wand that you can wave across surfaces, but I'm not sure if that's hundred percent effective at this point. Well, and I, I would imagine that's not instant. It would need time. So it's yeah. not like you could just go up, oh, that area is done. I imagine it needs a certain amount of exposure yes. to kill things. Uh, yes. You know, just like it takes a while to kill a human. You can't just, whoop, you're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and, and and you, guys awesome. didn't, you guys didn't know that? <laughs> I thought everyone knew that. <laughs> oh, by the way, Brian, I apologize. I didn't introduce you to Griffin, who's down below with the masterful beard. Uh, hey, Griffin. <laughs> hey, Brian. How you doing? Good. It, it's changed three coming. times whilst you've been talking. It's just... Yeah, I, mean, it's, it's <laughs> I will remember your name. It's it's another uh, Family Guy reference right there. Brian Griffin. So... Yeah. Hey, there you go. <laughs> That's straightforward. Nice to be here. And there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Griffin. <laughs> no <way>. too good. <laughs> um, so, so, Brian, I mean, thinking through this and how you're even talking to your customers, how do you stop them from just being grossed out and freaked out by the fact that, you know, listen, there's no true 100% way because, honestly, if the person who's cleaning the room has it and doesn't know it, 
everything they just did, you know, isn't effective. Um, what are you right. doing to stop people from going insane? So, well, first of all, the particular point you just said, every time we have, every day, we monitor all of our staff. So first we take their temperature and make sure that they don't have that. And then we have a questionnaire that we ask, and it started out with uh, two or three questions. Uh, have you had a cough? Has anybody in your house been sick? And it's now grown to um, 10 or 12 questions. Uh, do you know anybody that's uh, been in contact with me from New York City? Anybody come here from Louisiana in the last 14 days? And if they answer yes to any of those, they cannot work uh, that day or that 14-day quarantine. Because the worst thing we could do is make a building uh, worse than it became in and better. I think um, I think Lauren would like to know that questionnaire. He's trying. To, he's been trying to develop a system to decide who he's going to spend time with. So if you could send Lauren <laughs> that questionnaire for personal use. Um, I mean, and as you can see, he's so uh, <laughs> serious. <laughs> I love when the system freezes. <laughs> oh, and now he's gone. He's been replaced by a waxwork of just Lauren. Yeah, it was amazing. He just wiped that wand across Lauren. And, he and, it, and it, yeah, it was. I guess I was wrong. It doesn't take that long after all. Um, what are you doing to protect so, your team? And what should hotels think about, you know, as they're ad adapting to new cleaning procedures with, you know, much more powerful cleaning agents? Um, what is your average employee who's coming in and uh, fogging? What are they doing to protect themselves from the fogging? So we have uh, the fogging isn't the dangerous part. It's no. the virus that's the dangerous part. So oh, okay. we don't want them to get the danger, the, the, the virus. So we have a, a three categories. The first one is preventive cleaning, which is what we talk about here. We're doing and going in and we preventive cleaning before we're opening. Second is our category two. Somebody showed signs of being ill, but they have not been tested positive for COVID-19. And the third one is actual that they have confirmed cases. So what changes for us is on a preventative cleaning, we are using uh, N95 masks, uh, gloves, booties, and um, containing all the materials that we're using, bags and everything, and, and going into properly disposable um, containers. Um, on the ones that somebody has shown that they are sick or there is actual, they wear full face mask uh, respirators um, and wear a Tyvek suit, almost uh, looks like we're going to the moon cleaning. But that's that's for our protection of our, our employees. Um, doing the, the normal cleaning, um, the, the N95 masks are being used. Okay. Just on that, it, it's sort of a, a balance, I think, by the sound of it, of cleanliness and then not whipping up your guests into hysteria. If I come out of my hotel room and I see a cleaner go into the hotel, go into the room next to me, looking like one of the bad guys from ET, yeah. um, I'm, I'm immediately going to, you know, I'll check out and, and probably take my chances elsewhere. It's funny, but, not, yeah. to put, not to put it aside, but have you watched ET as an adult? Yes. Yes. <laughs> And you realize that the bad guys weren't really bad guys. They were actually just trying to help. But as a kid, like your angle was like, holy crap, all these bad adults. It, it blew my mind watching it for the first time as an adult with my kids. And I'm like, they weren't bad guys. They were going to do their job. They were going to do their job. That is the last, part, uh, last piece of my childhood head. Don't take it away from me. <laughs> and I, I want to agree with you, except... <laughs> you know there's a way to do that other than just scaring the crap out of all the kids is all i'm saying <laughs> yes. ah, but it was the 80s you know right i mean so adults like, were rough in the 80s. The 80s, as we all know yeah. um, <laughs> so so let, let me ask you brian so if i'm a hotel and, you know, it's likely that, okay, I'm going to have you come in before I open the hotel. Um, you know, I'm likely going to need to call you if I get a report that someone who came through my doors ended up being sick or even worse, sick with COVID-19. I'm going to probably have you come out. Um, so, I mean, are hotels able to work with companies like yours on retainer where it's like, you know, hey, you know, what, you're there when we need you type thing? So there is certain um, certain programs that we have that we come out um, and do some pre 
diagnosis of, of facilities so that we're prepared if something happens. And um, we technically don't ever, my company doesn't charge for that. There are some companies that would put us on retainer. But what we do in return is ask the head and that you sign off that if you have an incident, whether it's a water loss, water loss, um, or this type of thing, that we be the ones that you call. And so at that point, you are on our priority list. So the reason that we would want that done, we walk the building, we actually take photos of, and we make um, notes of key information of where um, key items are, such as shut off valves, electrical, stuff like that. Um, but we're prepared so that when you call, we can just pull that file up and, and go to that. Nice. It's nice. Our, so that's, it's that's pretty cool. I mean, having the ability for you to come out and test uh, at no cost by just saying that, hey, yeah, if something goes really bad, you you guys are going to be the guys. I mean, that's a pretty easy, uh, <laughs> pretty easy decision to make versus yes. paying to test, you know. Uh, that's pretty cool. So let's talk about. So the second one is if if, the, if our category three happens, there's actual tests of uh, done, and, and you're still running your resort. I would imagine that some wing would have to be shut off because um, we would have to have the hazmat suits and the, the full face masks and don't want to scare guests. So that would be in coordination with your team to you somehow control access to that, almost like it would be part of a construction site where we would enter through a certain area and lead through a certain area, but they would not see any um, actual guys looking like they're in hazmat suits, right? We would come in the building, dress as normally, dress as normal, but we would have areas where we have chambers and uh, gear up. There is, there is going to be some positives to that hazmat suit, though. If the cleaners are walking in, you're going to get a lot less people trying to steal from the car. When it's outside in the in the hallway. Let's be <laughs> yes. I'm gonna turn around and go the other way, you know? <laughs> you can keep your mini shampoo. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely so so you were talking about uh minimizing the rooms. Um you know, you, you had mentioned magazines, you had mentioned lampshades. Um, you know, what what other kind of key things should a hotel think about that they can do to make uh, a room uh, just a little designed a little better to be safer? So this is again, I'm not an expert in your, your industry. I just do things I read uh, recently, but it's it's the notepad, the pens on the desk. Uh, you go in there, people aren't touching them. Maybe it's limiting the amount of things around a coffee maker or something in a room, or how many packets are in the coffee maker that don't go from guest to guest. Uh, at that point, maybe you have to request or come up at the lobby so that people aren't touching them. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It raises an interesting marketing point. You know, uh, when you think about soft brands, obviously for many, many years, they have left directories in all the rooms. And it's been a very effective way to market the other properties in the soft brand, right? You've got 100,000 rooms in the soft brand, 150,000 rooms, things like that. You're putting your properties in front of theoretically 100,000, 150,000 guests every day. And, you know, I can speak from some experience on this that we do see that to be positive. You're saying that those are potentially problematic from a from a viral load perspective, for lack of a better term. Yes. For lack of knowing a better term, right? And so maybe we need to come up with some better way to leverage the guest in the room to promote the other properties. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, they're, they're, the film is going to sit on top of those, those materials. I've read uh, people are going electronic with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, doing some kind of iPad that's secured in the room, and you can clean that and wipe it off between guests and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, one of the one of the comments I made to a string on LinkedIn talking about Hilton's approaches. Um, let's not forget, majority of this is about making you know the largest amount of your travelers feel comfortable as possible, right. and um, you know some of this is you know standard precautions. You're going to open up your building for the first time. It's probably a good idea to have it just really well cleaned, anyways. Especially here in Florida, if you weren't running your ACs really well, uh, there's other bio that could have developed um non-human bio um you know but uh, one other point i made too is if you're talking about you know guest comfort guest security um having uh antibacterial wipes 
uh, or hand sanitizer as an amenity in the room so that they don't have to take your word for it. You know, they don't have to look at it and go, do I really want to touch that remote control? Because do I really trust that the housekeeper wiped it down appropriately? You know what? Let me just go pull a wipe, wipe it up myself. And now I'm comfortable. Uh, you know, so, so there are some simple things you can do uh, to build trust and, and you can make it a, an amenity. You know, hey, you know, we clean incredibly well, you know, all this stuff. But you don't have to take our word for it to make you comfortable. Here are antibacterial wipes for you. Right. And, and it's not just about the cleaning. It's about processes and procedures, you know, just things that add a little bit of confidence and then promoting those in, in all your marketing, free arrivals, things like that. So I've worked, recently been working with the Model Beach area, Chamber of Commerce and CBB and the Hospitality Association to create a set of guidelines that we're trying to get the entire destination to adopt. So just I dropped the link to that, the guidelines we came up with in the in the chat over there but we did it for hotels and restaurants and, and logic and uh, retail attractions and golf as well but we're getting so much buy-in and, and it's it's really about protocols it's about cleaning procedures but at the end of the day you know whether it's really making a difference or not it probably is but it's probably not making as big a difference in reality as it will to the psychology of reducing fear to the guests. So you've got to use it as a marketing tool. It should be promoted everywhere. Here are the things we're doing to keep you safe, our staff safe, and our local community safe. Because people care about that stuff. Well, Ed said that what I think is going to be the magic word, and I don't think I'm alone on this, but you know, it's going to be about trust, right? At a certain point, guests have to trust that they are not going to be exposed to illness, they're not going to be exposed to hazard in any way, that their kids aren't going to be exposed to illness, right? That their employees, if we're talking, you know, business travel and the like, aren't going to be exposed to, um, you know, liability issues and things like that. So it's going to become a trust problem. Yeah. But and that, that's going to be different. Ed and I had a webinar yesterday with Navis, yeah. and we were talking about this similar thing in, in that that trust is going to be different to every single individual. When that's they right. feel like they're, they're over the hump of fear, and it's going to be a moving target with every guest. That's so right. I, mean, I just thinking about myself, I went into my office for the first time after this craziness hit about a month ago, and I was petrified of touching anything. I was washing my hands vigorously and constantly. And then I went back in again this week, and it, I haven't been in a lot, but I've been in a few times. But each time I realized I'm, I'm a little less fearful, even though pr practically nothing has changed. Right. Other than my the psychology of it, right? Well, I, and you, you also to... remembering that for like three weeks prior to the shutdown, you had the flu and you were in the <laughs> And you gave it well, to half true, of us that... here. I, I think <laughs> from a trade think, show. Yeah, so, Stuart, Stuart was more worried about going in there and catching more work. That was right. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's already got enough. I don't want any more. I have to disinfect. All of these bills. Delete, delete. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 Brian, um, if you had any advice, if uh, for a hotel owner or a GM that happens to be watching and is thinking about how far they go here, I mean, what advice uh, do you have? So, a device is if you're going to use somebody to help you with this. Um, he's a reputable company. Um, Look at the pricing, look at what they're doing with it, and making sure what they're saying they're doing is, is trackable and uh, being able to be used. Like I said earlier, you're probably okay if it's been sitting for a month, but it's the idea of the image of getting out there and making sure that it's clean and you can pull. Yeah. Um, my apologies, guys. Uh, the Florida Power and Light decided that they need to change the transformer outside my office. Mm -hmm. Click. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't lose uh, simulcasting, although some people online on all the channels, we have several hundred, thank you very much, uh, went black. They could hear us, but they couldn't necessarily see us for a couple moments until so I could change the screen over. I apologize to everyone, but just some of the comments that got caught up other than the what the hell happened to the screen. Uh, <laughs> was talking about affirmation about uh, testing staff every day, making sure they're wearing glass, masks and gloves. Uh, just some stuff that people were throwing in the conversation dialogue about some of the things that they are probably doing at their properties at this particular moment. So, yeah, one exactly. thing I've seen, which is pretty cool, is folks using it as an opportunity not to scare people with their masks, but it, it can be branded. You can get custom logo face masks that, that look like part of the uniform, and, and it kind of makes it a little more normal. So I think look for opportunities here to not necessarily scare 
the guests while you're trying to reassure them. Hey, I saw a new Chotsky idea. It's a little clip that goes on the back of your head so that the things don't go over your ears and you can brand it. It's a, the ear saver or something. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to buy some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm going to any conferences. Why buy them? You, you can know, make them with roll. popsicle sticks, Lauren. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just draw your logo on it. Made with love by Lauren You have Gray. seen my handwriting, right? You think I can draw any better? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I This popsicle everything. stick, personally cleaned by Lauren Gray, eating the ice cream off of it. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a little German. That's a bit of biofilm on that one. That's <laughs> cool. Coated with Lauren Gray biofilm. <laughs> yeah. Limited edition. Yeah, I'm going to find that in the paper. I'm going to find your story. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, so, guys, do we have any go back to talking about something less disgusting like poop? <laughs> less disgusting equally as funny um you missed it griffin brian was talking about how you know the different things that they uh do restoration for and every time he said the word poop the and every host on the show giggled like, a, like an eight-year-old I do, I do have a question from walter he says we certify or i guess it's a question here. we certify toilet bowls with paper ribbon and to fold the tp into a triangle is it possible to put things like a remote control into a paper package, letting the guests know it was properly cleaned. Oh, that's a good idea. That actually is a good idea. I think that's much better. I've talked about this on the show before. I was in a hotel not long ago, and now it's probably three, four months ago, but where they had the the remote control that has the special coating on it that basically shows that it is disinfected. And I've never wanted to touch a remote control less in my life. Because normally you don't even think about it. And now they're drawing attention to the fact that God only knows what germs are on these things. Well, I mean, something like that, where it's, you know, sanitized for your protection and you unzip it or unpack it, it's actually a really yeah. good idea. Well, um, actually, I mean, if you if you wanted to do it to where it felt really nice and it was presented really nice, is everything like that in the room being put in a single space for you to find everything. Yeah, I think we spoke about this last week, like having a transparent packet on the bed where you open it up and you've got maybe like the, the cups and the spoons and things that you know are either going to be single use or have already been sanitized and are yeah. in place. Your coffee, tea, all of that stuff. Yeah. But you, you've also got tech as well. I mean, I've, I've not checked, but surely there must be an app for turning the TV over with your iPhone that you've just got to sync into the TV. You know, I, I, and my daughter keeps telling me that your iPhone has got more germs on it than the toilet seat. She takes, she's a bit of a germaphobe before this happened. The only grosser thing than your phone is your steering wheel in your car. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. Not getting got a lot of use in a minute, Eddie, if I'm honest. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> it's completely disinfected for the last four weeks. It's yeah, all that sunlight, right? <laughs> yeah, sat there. I'm going to get yeah. gas since the beginning of February today. I mean, I'm finally on the E line. It's like, yeah, time to get gas since February. <laughs> So, well, it's, cheap, it's cheap now. <laughs> so, yeah. so Brian, um, you know, uh, was there anything else you wanted to go over before we start to move on to our weekly topics? No, uh, just the fact, you know, obviously I would love to clean all the buildings I can, but the fact is um, there are certain times when we are needed and required and then we will be a big service and we will come and, and provide a value or at this time and whether it's assurance or um assurance for your customers we can do that for you that's nice. great and and if someone wanted to learn more about Recromax and you where would they go uh recromax.com r-e-c-r-o-m-a-x.com okay great and so you're welcome to stay and goof around with us um we do <laughs> want to be respectful for your time so no no hard feelings if you don't want to go into the, uh, I mean, as you can see, we've been struggling to hold this as a serious conversation <laughs> up until this point. Um, you know, but yeah, otherwise we're going to, to move on to uh, some of the topics of the week. All right. I'm going to go check on my guys. You see if they're cleaning some poop up and we'll go. For this. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. All of us smile. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for joining us and, and oh, sharing with Brian. us uh, about what you're up to. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks Brian. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate your time. Well. <laughs> so that's the thing for today. Poop. Sorry. So... <laughs> so when, you, when, you, when, Ed, when you said, you know, you'll have people walking around the room just swishing a light one, woof. It just made me think, 
Like you cleaners are going to look like extras in Harry Potter, just wandering <laughs> around with a light wand, waving it over things, yeah. trying to expel the arms. Luminous. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Wingardium disinfecto. Yes. Yeah. from Hogwarts at the end. Oh my yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> This so, be- you know, I, I think this is an important uh, important thing to talk about, though, is the difference between clean and disinfected. And I think for marketers, um, their focus should be on disinfected. Um, you know, what, I've already seen some early marketing on, you know, people trying to talk about their cleaning procedures. And I'm sorry, all of it sounds like you were disgusting before this happened. And, and we know that's not the case, uh, but a traveler doesn't. And so, you know, if, if I had to walk away from, you know, what, what Brian was talking to us about, it is that the conversation should be about disinfecting, uh, which is different than cleaning. But do you think the average consumer deciphers the difference between those two? Like, I think you can. To me, disinfection to, to a lemon might sound like it was infected and now it's not. I think, so you, I think we can. potentially exacerbate the problem. Uh, that's yeah. I mean, I guess you could. I mean, you do need a narrative of we've always taken, you know, serious precautions in cleaning. Um, you know, and actually, uh, Brian did bring up something that you know I'm sure others have maybe thought of is our ties to the restaurant industry, who's been dealing with this level of cleanliness as a requirement. Um, actually, it's maybe something smart to talk about you know, that we've been experts in, you know, clean surfaces uh, due to restaurant regulations, blah, 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 blah. We're now applying extra steps, uh, you know, to our approach to, to turning over rooms, to, to not make it sound like it was a cesspool before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's about making people feel safe, right? That, that's what it comes down to, that I'm, I'm not in any danger. So however it makes sense for you to, to spin that narrative, and I think it is, We've always been clean, but here are the extra things we're doing to keep you guys, you and your family safe. I think that's the narrative. That I Words know. like extra steps, additional steps. Words that, mm-hmm. that, that, that suggest you're building on what you've already done. What was already yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, but addressing addressing everyone's sort of concern, the elephant in everyone's room, um, rather yeah. than COVID nineteen. Well, that that's I mean, that was a, that was that's a really good point because there was already a register of whether a room was clean or not out there it was trip advisor all your guests were saying whether the room was you know pretty pretty average good or absolutely fantastic it's not just about service if you go and actually read trip advisor there's loads of cases where people are talking about uncleanliness dirty this and the worst the worst culprits culprits rather there was pictures up there as well you could see it you know you've just got to go mm-hmm. and type the google search and the, the name of a hotel and when google auto suggests bed bugs after it i'm instantly not even going to their website and i'm going to go look somewhere else right yeah, you know? yeah. so there was, there was already that sort of level of register there and, and i think to ben's point adding the extra you know not only do we not have bed bugs we also don't have coronavirus but how do you make it sound well, sense in a marketing message that you fogged a room like there, there is no sexy spin i can't imagine a banner ad who just no, no, what you, what you can do, though, Ben, is, is you know, and I've seen some people doing things along those lines, you know, create some content marketing that shows this is how our housekeepers, you know, put it on your blog, on your website. Oh, this is how our housekeepers actually, you know, clean and disinfect our rooms, you know, and it's not something you have to promote all the time. It's just a piece of Well, that's there. actually, past the early days, it's not something you should promote. You should have available for passive discovery because that's continued exactly promoting... Right. right. Continued promoting of it's just going to keep it top of mind. This That's is right. a this is a yeah. trap no, that no. businesses fall into all the time. When an issue arises, they instantly think everyone knows that issue for them exists, and they make the mistake of addressing that issue, mm-hmm. and that actually is educating a wide audience that that issue existed. You know, yeah, it, 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 and this is something that just occurred to me right now. So I've done no work on this specifically, but there's probably an opportunity to go back and look at you know. Uh, the Tylenol situation in the 80s and things along those lines, you know, real crisis management. For those who don't remember this or too young, you know, there was a big issue in the United States where uh, Tylenol bottles were tampered with and a number of people died. And it was, you know, they pulled Tylenol. Tylenol actually this generally taught as a, as a case study in crisis management. They pulled all Tylenol products from all shelves in all stores everywhere in the world for a period of, you know, six to eight weeks. And as they reintroduced the product, they clearly had to go through a messaging thing to get people to trust them again. So I think there's 
probably a lot of lessons there that we should be looking at and saying, you know, how has this been done well in the past by others who've gone through not the same thing, obviously, but a similar kind of situation where we're talking about, you know, risks to public health and safety. Yeah. Well, and I think one of, the, one of the best ways to do it is to, to reintroduce the hospitality element, right? right. To, to humanize it, to put people, your actual housekeepers or someone you know, portraying a housekeeper talking about why it matters, why they care. What, you know, so it's not just a building that's being cleaned. It's people that are taking care of you. It's, it should be a housekeeper because it's weird if yeah. you have to put the disclaimer, not an actual housekeeper. Yeah, and, and get it, right? <laughs> but not every housekeeper is going to be, you know, want to do that or, or going to be the right kind of person well, to be presenting that that message. But I think if you do have, you know, your head of housekeeping that is willing to do that, that would be perfect and, and be passionate about why they care deeply about the, these extra cleaning well, protocols. And, it goes back to one of our earlier conversations, and Lily brought up a, an excellent passive way of showing it, where a housekeeper was showing how to clean properly by cleaning one of their own rooms and in, in, in passively showing the extent and the detail that you're cleaning your room by helping, hopefully helping, people understand how to clean their own their own homes and so forth mm -hmm. as the contact services yeah. and all. But even yesterday, I was uh, broadcasting on a HOA, um, and Chip was on there uh, from IHLA, and he was talking about the differentiation even that hotels can exploit with the persistent cleaning and regulations that we are under compared to mm -hmm. uh, vacation rentals and Airbnbs and so forth, where we show a persistent, if somebody has to clean Airbnb, where do you go? Where's the structure of that cleanliness? Now we know there's cottage industries that go out and literally clean the Airbnbs, but there's no perception of that in comparison to a professional cleaning system crew mm -hmm. located in a hotel branded or not. There's a, there's more of a persistent, uh, uh, belief that there is a, a control factor to the to what hotels have to do. So, you know, I think it's a massive advantage. And if you look at the sentiment studies that are out there, a lot of people just assume that people would rather stay in vacation rentals than they would hotels right now, just because they're more isolated. But if you look at the data, that's not what people are saying. They trust hotels because they are professionally clean. So I definitely think that's an angle you can exploit. Well, and I also think as a vacation rental operator. Uh, there's an opportunity to distance yourself from what, because don't forget with vacation rental, um, VRBO uh, very much sticks in people's heads as being there uh, and, you know, not necessarily professionally turned over. So if you are a, a, a professional scaled vacation rental management group yeah. uh, talking about how you take uh, a hotel level or even better than a hotel level approach to mm -hmm. uh, turning units uh, is, is something very smart. Because our, our audience here isn't just hotels. We do have VR people mm -hmm. who, yeah. who tune in and watch. Um, you know, that is something that they, you know, as a professional manager, you should be thinking about because there is a consumer perception that, yes, when you go stay at Stuart Butler's house, because he rents one of his rooms in Myrtle Beach in the summer, um, Stuart's not cleaning it. It's full of biofilm. It's full of biofilm. So, so Brent in the chat a question, that sounds yeah. about having housekeeper presentation and how to get the word out to guests. I think what we're all saying, and I, I, if somebody has a different point of view on this, by all means, chime in. But I think what we're all saying is you create the content, you have the content available on your website, it probably becomes a line in the reasons to book your act. You know, uh, you know no booking fee, uh, ease of cancellation, whatever, 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 cleanliness procedures, et cetera. And it's a link to that piece of content, but let people passively discover it. You know, because I think if we're promoting, hey, we're clean, again, you run the risk yeah. of, hey, we were disgusting yeah. previously. I yeah, I, like, hey, no murders in the last 14 years in this building. <laughs> but prior to that, poof. <laughs> I, I think what you have to do is add it to your text like you do with GDPR, C CCPA, um, your ADA requirements and so forth. This is a conditional aspect of your, your dialogue on your site. This is a aspect of our cleanliness policies, our cleanliness protocols or what have you. And then I'd like to add into Brent, answering a little bit of Brent's question too is if you're doing your social well, if you're doing it into the context of constant about, uh, exposure of what you you know the value of your proposition is, your your location, the things around you, so forth and so on, this includes it into the dialogue in a capacity of hey, and, and given the current circumstances and so on, we'd like to be helpful in saying how do you really clean a bed, you know, or how do you really clean a bedroom, or how do you really clean contact services, and actually have your housekeeper enthusiastically go over and show what we do as policy and procedure within the hotel, so that there's a way of transferring it over, so you can do it in a in a 
in a conversational way without it having to be formally walking in saying, this is how we clean the room and this is what we do, you know, so. But it, but it also, it's it's the timing of the message as well, as, as we've mentioned here. I think, you know, first and foremost, you have to get that message out. So it does need to be a little bit more prominent um, on your website during these these early early weeks, months, days, weeks, months, however long it's going to be, you know, whenever lockdown or whatever it is going to disappear. But over time, it then it, it will gradually disappear. Think, think if you mentioned the perfect example there, Lauren, GDPR. I mean, when that first came in, there was hysteria over it, and it was, you know, it's the latest acronym that we all had to talk about. It was meeting after meeting, and you have to make sure this and your website is up. Now it's like, yeah, we're GDPR compliant tick, and it's literally the mm. this, aspect of it because you've been through the procedure and everyone's got comfortable with it human nature yeah but gdp yeah. i didn't kill anyone <laughs> uh, well i don't know it nearly killed me trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> i mean there were long meetings i get that but yeah i, get that. <laughs> I wanted to kill people at the end of it you know yeah. okay so but, i wanted to, i wanted to introduce the top topic that robert cole who has now rec- in a record three-week absence he has, has already missed. told us, forward-looking, for the foreseeable future, he will not be on the show. Yeah, yeah. which is, considering that he has been a, a, a soured person on this show for all the time that we ever started it almost, that's a pretty uh, a busy, he's that busy. But his top topic, I wanted to introduce is like Scotty out of Star Trek. Because, you know, you look at the, the Star Report where it talks about the, the loss of all the, the, the GDPR and GoPars and stuff. I just pictured when, when here I'll put the link up, that of Scotty out of Star Trek going, Captain, your GoPod is down to 2%. And da, 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 da. It just, there's the, every number is like a bleak, bleak aspect. Well, of what I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. This is why I've kind of stayed away from Robert's uh, social media chat because it yeah. is so negative. <laughs> it's, it's a spiraling clean with no engines, both on fire. Continuing to talk about the fact <laughs> that everything is closed right? and that mm-hmm. hurts numbers. I'm I'm so past it. I've actually been past it for almost three weeks now because it's obvious. You know what? Let's talk about Lauren's property in Vancouver that is running at 67% occupancy and making money. Let's talk about, you know, Alden uh, Suites in, uh, you know, in uh, over on the Gulf Coast. That's running at 40% occupancy and, and it's peaking more now because the beach is open back up. Right. Let's talk about that everything doesn't suck. Right. I'm I'm so oh, yeah. over, I don't want to be so I don't want to talk it's about not the helpful. It's not helpful. It's not helpful right. to it's look at the cars right now. Nothing you can do about that. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Right, exactly. We gotta focus on what we can do right now and what we can do for a long term strategy so that twelve months, twenty four months from now we're in a better position than, than we are right now. Right. And so I mean I I SDR day. talking about STR reports is the new Airbnb. So I, 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 I thought somebody had to oh, easy now. Easy. Yeah. Let's, let's I, I heard the best down. analogy uh, uh, on a conversation earlier this week. They said, if you ever wanted to know what your car did when you threw it in reverse while you're going 60 miles an hour, this is what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. The point is the numbers are crap. The numbers will be worse in April. And then realistically, the numbers probably aren't going to get much worse in all seriousness. They may get worse in markets that have been, you know, touched less. But the fact right. of the matter is, mm-hmm. you know, one of two things is true for many properties right now. You are either closed or demand has, you know, fell, fallen through the floor. We know that's true. What do you do to prep for when demand starts to return or if you're in those markets where demand has not died off as much, right? I mean, I think Ed's exactly right. Yeah, but numbers probably aren't going to get a lot worse after April because once they fall to zero, they can't go negative. And the data you should be looking at is forward-looking data, understanding for your specific situation, what are the indicators that tell you when you should make decisions? Um, shameless plug for Griffin and the folks at ScreenPilot, they put together some great content and came on our podcast a few weeks ago and, and talked about that. They talked about here's some things you can be looking at right now that is actually impactful. It's not reverse data. It's what's in ahead of you. What what about your conversion rate on your booking engine? What about the, the pace of your bookings from meta search? What about uh, doing a survey to your guests to understand their sentiment right now and when they're going to be ready and continuing to do that? So we're looking at your social signals. For and I got to be honest with you, about. certain markets we're seeing are already experiencing a sharp enough uh, increase in yep. demand that you can say beach and mm-hmm. mountain 
yeah. are going to experience a V-shaped recovery. Yeah. Like it's already clear. Yeah. It's even a V-shaped recovery that you give. That's why I did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I work in marketing, guys. It's yeah. all about like the, the little details. <laughs> um, but I mean, we can already see that um, for for a lot of the nature based uh, tourism, um, the first week of April was the bottom, uh, demand wise. Yeah. The uh, the novice um, uh, uh, webinar that you two did, I, I caught the start of it uh, this morning. I was interrupted by a angry five year old. Um, and you were two, interrupted because you remembered you needed to put the cardboard table together and you wanted to test it before coming on the show. Let's be honest. <laughs> it was like five o'clock in the morning. Um, and there were, there were two things that you guys that, that you guys were speaking about. The first thing I think you said um, was uh, last year's data doesn't exist. The last year's right. numbers, it, the beginning of time might as well have been January 1st, 2020. Because the world that you're looking at then is no longer the same. So saying, oh, we're, you know, we're up, we're down X percent, doesn't matter, it's a pointless phrase. And the, you, you also mentioned, I think it was the, the host webinar, that um, the property in California, I think it was, is, is seeing comparable, I think it was for this month or next month, com for bookings, August. comparable, was it for August, comparable <laughs> bookings to the previous year, which I know doesn't exist, but for the purpose of this sentence does. Um, is that because of you know the mountains and the beach? Is that the areas? Yeah, that it's uh, so where they were talking about uh, the specific hotel that was, was being talked about is one of those nature type experiences. Um, what remains to be seen, and I got to be honest with you, I was um, I was not overly uh, optimistic for Orlando. I live in Orlando, and one of my biggest fears was how the theme parks would reopen. Orlando is a hospitality. Um, pressure cooker majority of the hotels live because of intense compression and you know if the theme parks aren't hitting high enough numbers uh, the amount of inventory in this market is just insane uh, what has recently started to change my outlook on, on Orlando is the um, the opening plan for the state and their guidance for theme parks is the theme parks in phase one will open at 50% capacity. And going into phase two will be at 75% capacity, which means there's a high likelihood that the theme parks will be at 75 or 100% capacity for the summer season, which is incredibly important to this market. Uh, because the fall is going to be tough. The winter is going to be tough because in September, October, Orlando gets by on trade show. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's not there, there's not going to be a huge amount of those. We will have enough, but not enough to create that compression to feed the market. Um, so I'm actually starting to turn bullish even on Orlando uh, because my fear for Orlando was government restriction, uh, keeping the market from being able to operate correctly. But any of our beach clients, you know, uh, great outdoor type clients, I'm holding back on saying state park because, again, government intervention can potentially screw up the, uh, the recovery for that. But I will say if they open state parks, I know state parks will shoot right back up because prior to being forced to shut down, uh, they were having better marches than they had had ever. And it was because people were diverting trips from further away trips they had to now we got to do something. All right, we'll go do state park. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I do think many markets uh, that are strong leisure have that outdoor feel are going to feel, are going to see a V shape. I, it remains to be seen what city centers, tight city, city centers are going to see. It could be a W, right? You may go through a couple uh, V's. Um, but the demand, traveler demand, exists. Uh, it, and people want to get out. They want to do things. Everyone has a different definition of what is safe. And so there are enough people that think it's safe now and want to go do something. So that, did you read the, the icon Skift this morning? 40-something like percent of Americans. I'm sorry, I don't read Skift. <laughs> I refuse to. <laughs> Let me tell you what the article said. It. Okay. <laughs> Forty something percent of Americans, the first journey is going to be within hundred miles um, by car within the next ninety something days. 
Was that sponsored by Hotels.com's Captain Obvious? Or? I, don't, <laughs> I don't think it was. I don't think no. it was. I don't think it's yeah, hard to tell because everything on Piff is an advertorial, so I figured maybe it was a Hotels.com thing. Yeah, it's good to turn into the dark side for us on that one because of their current issues. Yeah. Sounds like, um, cool, current kind of issues. It sounds like there's some, some drama there. No, no, no. It's, they're, they're, their culture, they're their culture is very legal. challenged. However, let's let's get back to the <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's not for public discussion, ladies and gents. Yeah, um, you were supposed to. This is right. where I bring everybody back to the yes, topic. Yes, yes. Uh, please, please. No, we're help. diverse group again. We're quick, we're, quick, quick mom and fear. We've got to behave. I know we needed a better <laughs> percentage. Really, Lily, we really needed you earlier because every time <laughs> our guest host said poop, the the whole the whole meeting just went off the rails. Well, thank. I, yeah. I believe that. Yes. Good has, I have heard that the social leisure is the first market back, staycations, but then I also hear that it'll be a corporate and small meetings. What is the consensus? I, I, I honestly think that day one of opening leisure, um, I don't think small meeting is going to be far behind. I think where you're going to see challenge is large scale meeting. Uh, and I don't think it's a challenge because there aren't people who want to do it. I think the challenge is going to be the, the risk profile of the meeting planner who puts those meetings together, just not wanting to even try for this year. Right. Just real quick, by the way, let's if we can do this, because I think it's an interesting question across the board. Can we just do a quick, you know, straw poll? So, Ed, you're saying leisure followed by small meetings, you know, Ben? Leisure? I don't know if by the business. Leisure. But yeah, a lot of leisure. I, I think leisure, but I, I, I do think corporate is, is, is going to come in because business still has to happen. It does, but there's going to be more people doing remote. In my opinion, now if this if if this as far as anything is, you don't need to go somewhere to do something. I think I think you and I are tainted with that because we've been remote for years. So this this is this is just Friday. Right, but remember, companies like McKinsey and SAP and all of that make a lot of money off of sending their consultants to you, and they're going to want to make that billable. So hold on, let's get let's get our right, keep going. Yeah. To, sorry, keep us in line, Griffin. There, uh, yeah, leisure would be my vote. Uh, I think beyond that, and I won't dive too deep, but I think beyond that, uh, even stronger part of the business will be some ancillary coming back. I mean, if, if your property, take advantage of that right now, right? If you have golfers out there, if you have uh, F&B, find some way to put some kind of package together to get them coming back for for their leisurely, you know, staycation as well. Um, but yeah, I think those two, kind of the ancillary and the, and the leisure will be the, the primary to come back first. Stuart? Uh, it's got to be international flight first. No question. <laughs> <laughs> Let you. me send you a gift. Uh, yeah. to go back to England, Stuart. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. No, it, it, it's clearly going to be leisure first and it's going to be short trips. When we did our sentiment study, we asked the question, how soon after restrictions are lifted will it be before you travel um in we did it you know under one month one to three three to six six to nine and above 12 months but we broke it down by how far you're willing to travel and the mode of transportation so it was interesting because we asked in your local area and that was slightly lower percentages but when we broke it down geographically it, it depended greatly where you live because if you live in new york you're not going to want to travel in your local area right but if you live in the boonies somewhere it, it makes sense but if we broke it down to I'm willing to travel within two hours, it was 70% said that within the first three months, they'd be willing to travel up to two hours. And then if you went to six hours, it drops significantly. And up to mm -hmm. 10 hours, it drops even more. So people are going to kind of dip their toe in the water and venture out. So I think the lead is going to come back in in the phase of quick trips. You know, these, these So I think we're going to see shortened uh, length of stays initially, and then it, it's going to grow back. But I kind of am in, in the middle on business. I think it will come back, but not nearly as strong as it has. I think there's certainly an argument that uh, business can be performed better and, and people can make more money by traveling on business trips. But I think uh, the, the economy is going to mean that some of those superfluous trips, those unnecessary trips, are going to be reduced because people are watching the penny. So, so I think the demand is going to be less, but I think it will come, start to come back and if you're aggressive about targeting that, then I think you can be successful. One of the things Ed said yesterday on the Navis uh, thing was 
everyone's got to switch their mindset. We can't be gatherers anymore. We've all got to be hunters. We've got to go look for business. Yeah. And so now is the time to really start thinking through for your specific category and your specific destination. Who are those people that are going to be traveling first? And how do I go seek them out and get in front of them before someone else does? Because we're all going to be ravenously hungry and we're going to get really aggressive. Advertising costs are going to go up through the roof when everyone's back on. So you've got to be out in front of that now. Lily, you you take any... a bunch of low cost. <laughs> Thank you for the short answer, Stuart. You have any <laughs> answer? <laughs> and <laughs> may I add? <laughs> <laughs> and in conclusion. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. just glad that I got to go last because as per I'm usual. Right. I haven't just... gone to Lauren or me yet. So, you know. Uh, well, you know. You yours, is, yours won't matter after what I have. Yes. So I I do agree generally that I think leisure is going to be the first one. And I might be a little biased based on how dramatically I would like to get out of the house to travel for leisure. Um, but I don't think that I'm the only one either. So I think that you know, barring major financial issues with leisure travel, like personal finances of travelers, that leisure will definitely um, be one of the fastest to return. Not at 100%, of course, but definitely better. I think that we, as a society, we have a limited amount of time that we can tolerate anything. So everybody's like jumping on the bandwagon with stay home. Well, most everybody wear masks and blah, blah. But I'm starting to see in my interactions with people that all this goodwill is starting to wear a bit thin at this stage. And I think that we're going to see some of that just get thrown out the window as people just can't deal with the idea of being cooped up anymore. Um, so some people may make terrible financial decisions to travel and we welcome all of them. But the, um, <laughs> but the, the really important point that I wanted to make is we're going back and forth on corporate what we really need moving forward is corporate segmentation, kind of the way we do group segmentation, because I think the reason we can't agree is because it's not the same answer for every type of company, right? Like there's plenty of companies that will not need to travel to conduct business. There's others to Ed's point, like McKinsey, where they make a lot of money on travel. So they may be trying to bring that back sooner than later. Um, but there's also companies that work on infrastructure, construction, that's going to be one of the first to come back, I imagine, if projects have been put on hold and they need to re-engage them or what have you. So yeah, I government think contracting as right, well, exactly. you know, where you have to have clearances and you can't do those things remote like that. Right. That'll be that actually will probably be up for a bit because exactly. they, they've been stuck for for a bit and they have to catch up. So that's why I think like really we need to look at corporate as more of a segmentation of types of business because again, my whole like soapbox about segmentation, it's supposed to be about travelers who behave similarly. Mm -hmm. All corporate does not behave similarly. Therefore, we really need some sub segments to that. Lily, I agree with you 100%. Stuart was wrong. <laughs> yeah, we, said the, we said the exact same thing. Right, Lauren, you've got to be more. I have a new slogan I'm going to start marketing with. I'm taking it from Lily. I'm giving Lily full credit for it. No vacation is worth having unless it buries you in debt. <laughs> <laughs> but to Brent's question, it does seem like leisure is is you know the the. I would actually, yeah, but I would disagree with Stuart, and I mean this sincerely in one aspect of it. I don't think it's a short-term travel comparison. I think it's going to actually be the first trip. It's going to be the longer duration trip. People will want to get out of the house for a little bit longer than a day or two. Uh, they may not be in the same place for more than a day or two. I'm not saying that you're going to harbor them for four or five days stay, but I think if they're going to get away from the house, on um, getting out of the house like this penned up that we're talking about, and they have the financial means and the time availability to do so, I mean, there's criteria to this, this statement is that they will go over and take a three to five day. I got to get the heck out. Maybe we hit a couple I'll, of I'll take the wager. I'll Wait. take that wager. That's 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 take that. Yeah. Not, not, but I, I mean, but I, I do. I have the consensus. BC. I think transit is going to be the first opportunistic uh, 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 play for most hotels is to get, and that has a contingency too on the infrastructure around the hotel as well. Or if you're a destination hotel resort whether you have the, the full facilities to actually go to bear on it, because, uh, you know, nobody's going to show up at a hotel in a dead town. 
Mm. Uh, so, you know, it's got to have to have its, its infrastructure around you as well. And that has to be clearly known before people will make that decision choice. They'll get out of the house, but they're going to pick the best place to go. I'm so sorry, on this. One quick thing, and then I actually have to drop because I got to have a one o'clock. And I, gotta <laughs> um, I, I, I am going to say yes to what most people said. I think it's going to be leisure. I'm all in on this with at least the clients I'm dealing with and the markets that I'm dealing with where we're talking about um, backyard and bundle, right? We're talking leisure. We're talking folks who are close in. We're talking, you know, package appropriately so that you can price appropriately because there's going to be people who are going to have less money to spend. Um, and you got to think about how do you then capture more share of wallet once they're on, in market. And I think Griffin's exactly right, whether it's golf, whether it's F&D, whether it's, you know, packaging with other folks in market. Um, but it's definitely going to be a case of, I think, leisure, then corporate, but it's going to be short duration local trips. And I will also take the other side of Warren's bet from that perspective. Um, Walter on LinkedIn said, uh, small regional car travel meetings should be fine. Large national air travel meetings are going to be hurt. Right. Uh, by the way, one, one thing that leads me in that direction specifically um, is if you look at the way countries who are planning to reopen their businesses and the like are planning to reopen, one of the big stop gaps, or one of the big gaps rather, is, you know, if you look at Israel's plan, they have a two-week reopening for various phases, you know, so phase one is X, phase two is something else, phase three is something else, and there are two weeks between each as well, and phase two is hotels, and phase three is air travel, so I think there's going to be government restrictions on air travel, you know, I know the State Department, for instance, in the United States is making it difficult right now to get passports. I, I'm actually due for a renewal and I can't get my passport renewed right now because I don't have a uh, essential business travel that must make that happen at the moment. Oh, right? that's just the Border Patrol finally caught up with your aliases. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Yeah, that's true. I am. I am, of course, a member of Narcos, um, <laughs> as, as you can tell. Uh, but... but you know, but that is a situation where air is going to lag for a time, and I think air is going to have bigger trust problems than hotel and the like. So you're especially see- after those uh, those visuals of a person sneeze and how it's so absolutely because that's not a that's not a cleanliness thing. That's a, no, that's, that's a trust and confidence. Thing. And not just that, you know, that's exactly how it goes because there's always the question of what's that smell right. on a plane, right. and it Poop. could be it is <laughs> one of my favorite games. To play. <laughs> What's that? I'll name that spelling one. <laughs> okay, sorry, just going back to the, the conversation previously, I've got to agree with Stu on this. Um, uh, if you look at the context people are in, they're going to have had, <coughs> a lot of them are gonna, a lot of people are going to be furloughed, so they're going to have no money. You're going to have your twelve hundred dollar check, your unemployment. You're going to be cooped up in a house. I can talk from personal experience here, guys. On lockdown with two young children. Um, I don't want to get out of the house for five days and go to a different set. I want to stare at some different walls, even if it's for a day. And if you're in the, if you if you have you have cabin fever in your house, you have limited money available. And also, if I, if I'm a business and I furloughed my staff, I and and the lockdown's lifted, I don't want them running off for five days. I want them coming back to work and generating revenue. So I I I'm with Stuart. I think they're going to be short term. Yeah. Short-term local stairs just to look at a different damn so thing. I have to share the glory well, of being right. I'm going to challenge you. I do that think problem. both are going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I do have to drop it. Tim, I'd like to see you. Tim, you Tim, 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 Tim where can people find you? Uh, TimPeter.com. Uh, but stay safe, stay well, uh, and look forward to seeing you all next week. All right? Good to see half the house. Thank you. Yeah, you're actually looking at a third of my new space. Uh, there's no, nothing on the walls yet. There's still one box right there. Mm. You know, I'm just waiting for the super tiny sign like you had at the last office. Wait, yeah. wait, this one? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I'm going to do the show every week going forward. <laughs> it, it looks a lot better. I'll be honest. Brought Actually, because we can we can see the mirror of your view, which looks quite nice. Uh, it's, it's lovely. I'm overlooking. Uh, I don't know something. I don't even know what that is that I'm looking at. I think that's the county. I think that's the county uh, um, building. You know, the county. Oh. Building. So I'm not really sure though. I'm gonna have to find out. We can't go outside, so I actually have no idea what's around me. <laughs> Tim, Tim be, 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 before you go, there, there, there is something I, I wanted to share, and it, it, it's to Ben's point here about the kids. 
um, you know, if, if they're really, really getting on your nerves right now um, and you want to save a bit of money as well, you know, furlough or whatever, you want to save a bit of money for Christmas, now is the perfect time to tell them that Santa has caught the virus and might not make it. We can oh, all man. hope that the elf on the shelf catches the virus. Oh, okay, yeah. let's, yeah. Just, yeah. let's yeah. just decide That's that now. <laughs> done. That well, one's done. Cheers, everybody. I'll see you next week. All right. Bye, Have a great time. Time. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> I, I have a quick question to everyone out there. In, in terms of that stir crazy culture that's going on right now and in a, a short stay if we take it even further where people's thoughts on um you know we have certain properties that we market the day use type of programs that they have going is that something that would be plausible in terms of the turnover and the amount of time that it might take now to be able to use that inventory is it something that's going to make the property seem like it has more foot traffic and not as clean or is it something that a property could could take advantage of with with that local market that's trying to get the hell out of their house yes yeah. <laughs> i think it really depends on your situation right i mean right. it's not going to be something that turns you from not profitable to profitable right now probably but it you know is it a little bit of revenue dripping in yeah i've got properties that are doing it successfully and i've got properties that don't want to touch it just because it doesn't make sense they're not going to have the demand to make it worth the while so plus day you has been a lower day risk day than it is isn't it a, a, a way to sort of go check any new cleaning policies or procedures you've got in place right. because you've got yeah. a lot less people, you know, heads and heads and near beds at the time. I, I know I'm going to be sharing yeah. the top of the mountain with nobody on this one because I truly think that people are going to want to get out and stay out longer than a day or two if they have the financial means compared to I the agree. duck. I, I, agree. I think they're going to want to. I agree. I and, I, and I think you guys are all like forgetting the very important point Lily made, which is they will go into debt to do it. You're all talking about them not having right. money and stuff like that. I don't think it's about a, money, though. This is an economy no, built money. on debt. So <laughs> it's yeah. not going to be the money that stops them from traveling. It's no going problem. to be any number of other things, like their boss won't let them go or, you know. It, it's not it's even that. Fit. It's the psychology of it, right? It's the fear side is what's going to keep people from doing anything too extravagant. One, they're going to stay close. So they don't not going to feel like they need that. to stay a long time. That. I don't disagree. And, and, and two, think about the first time you went into a grocery store or somewhere during this. Right, you were in and out. You were super vigilant. You you didn't spend a lot of time. But the third or fourth or fifth or sixth time you did it, you, you were a lot more cavalier about it. People yep. are going to dip their toe in. They're not going to go straight back to normal. They're just not. They're going to take their time, try things, see if they're comfortable, and then they're going to do it more. I will take a bet. I will. I will we can say. Let's look at June as the month, pick a market, and we'll look at the average length of stay for that market for June this year versus June last year. So not not volume, because there won't be as many, but we'll look at the average length of stay and I better shorter this year than last year. It can't be Myrtle Beach. Right. Well, why are you putting parameters around it? Because you <laughs> want it to be Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach's average length of stay in normal times is over a week in June. So well, let's, let's let's pick go a, to, let's though, pick a right? destination no, a, where it's average length of stay destination. was more like the average length of stay, which is 2.8. So I just want to back to our business travel. We're not oh, talking about business travel. We're talking about lease travel, right? It can't yeah. be a New York This wage is getting complicated. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm so I'm going to steer this back to marketing real quick. Um, <laughs> Says the revenue person. <laughs> right. <laughs> revenue and marketing convergence. Hello. So basically, I think that we need to start looking at our demographics differently, at least in the short term, because you know who I think is going to go travel for two or three day vacations? People who previously made under forty thousand dollars a year and are currently unemployed. They just got a raise. Right? Yeah. Yep. They just got mm -hmm. a raise. And historically, people who are in that pay grade are less um responsible perhaps with their money and oh, so they're going to see it as Lily, I brought up this point two weeks ago and I was, ago. I was applauded for how carefully I described you the did. situation <laughs> of the people you just went straight forward and called yeah, them I mean, it's, not across, it's not across the board certainly anytime you're dealing with 
demographics you're generalizing, right? Because frankly, we just can't base all of our marketing on each person individually or we'd go nuts. Um, But there is a good portion of that income level where they're just going to say, hey, this is free money. Mm -hmm. We won the lottery. How are we going to spend our lottery winnings? And turns out they have time. They don't need to ask for time off. Um, They may have children. And I also say this from my personal research for it into uh, Walmart as a second job. And all my coworkers there who I'm (laughs) sure would very much love to take advantage of this. So that's kind of the mindset. So I think that we're actually the worst to market to, I think, is the people who are formerly making between like 45 and 65,000. I would assume that that is the bracket that's hurting the most on unemployment right now Mm -hmm. because they still can't replace all of their income with the difference. They're not sure when they're going to be able to travel. They make enough to be comfortable generally, but they don't make enough to be spendy. So I think we're going to go from kind of the super low income to the super rich. And depending on what property you're at will depend which of those you target. Ben, didn't you say the people from the south of England are probably going to be those people that are thinking they won the lottery and, you know, smooth out their money and stuff? Hey, you got to quit, my friend. Today. You got to quit. Listen, there are entire neighborhoods in Orlando <laughs> that were built off the backs of foolish English people investing in real estate. So there's entire communities built off of that premise. <laughs> and you're welcome. You're welcome. Lord, Lord. If, you, if you're going to make lazy stereotype jokes, you've got to get the stereotypes right. I, I, I'm only referring to the only thing I've ever been told. There's northern and then there's southern and there's something in the middle. And that's oh, all there's a big difference. But we're all silver spoon, privileged snobs. And the northerners are all hardworking, underpaid people. You know, that's, that's the wow. stereotype. So it's, it's basically the opposite of the United States. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. yeah. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh. I said, I know I'm still one of the youngest people on this, uh, but you know that the Civil War is over, right? There's no more North and <laughs> South <laughs> division. We never had a Civil War in England. Still, I think, oh, no, no, we, we, we did, did have a Civil War in England, but it's still going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had the disagreement yeah, over a couple of Civil War, though. <laughs> 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 Oh, to that, to, to that, and I think you I think you make a very good point. There is there there is the hardship level that the money didn't replace the money, and that is a line that is under consideration for marketing. That you are going to find people that are going to be more conservative in their what they're going to do. Plus, also, if they're still working, they may not have the means to step away from work. And if they're not working, they're certainly not going to take the risk factor associated with spending too much money at that point. I don't know about you all, but I'm very much looking forward to a vacation because I have worked harder in the past month and a half than I have in years. And on top of that, as soon as I walk out of this tiny room that I've been doing that in, my children are on me like white on rice. I highly suggest a small boat in open water, just telling you. Just Everybody the, should be building blocks and garbage bags. Oh, oh, sorry, I went there again. <laughs> there you go again with the cleaning the house. Thing. <laughs> Everybody needs to invest in Great Wolf Lodge right now. I love Great Wolf because they're going to oh. be overrun because uh, you can ditch your children basically. So. <laughs> and for it's 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 going to be a right confidence level. It. I got to be honest yeah, with kid, you. Kid what I like about Great Wolf Lodge is they're set up that the stuff your kids want to do is also something you'd want to do anyways. Like right. I, I love their magic quest. Like I'm, I'm like trying to tell my kids to, you know, s- speed up. Come on. we got to get to the next thing. Come on, come on, come on. We're almost done. Uh, and they're like, my legs are tired. I'm like, That's the point. <laughs> That's the <laughs> point. I think, I think I'm gonna... What you were saying about the, 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 de- the demographics as well. Um, I, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of special offers um, out there, some deals. So there's potentially the ability to, to stay a, a vacation destination that would previously have also been out of your price range and you've got some extra cash as well. So it's almost like a double-edged sword. You've been able to you know, go for something that would potentially be a, a, a more aspirational stay or you know, on, on the bucket list, and you've got that little bit of extra cash to go and do it. It would be uh, it'd be very interesting to see what type of resort, uh, you know, resorts are. You know, right. And the good news is for all hotels, you're not competing with Cruise for the foreseeable future. No. So, mm. all oh, those no, people. They're, they're saying that they're getting record 
Rick of bookings in for next right? year. For, for next year, yeah, right. next year. Not for this year. You know what? Like, I keep... I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lily. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the fact that people are way up in bookings for next year on cruises still gives me hope because cruises are one of the most condensed areas. So that seems to imply that people who formerly liked cruises are going to book them anyway, regardless of the potential health risk of being close by. And I think there's so much going around about, oh, are we now only going to be able to put one person every three rows in a tour bus and things like that? I just don't think, honestly, that this country has the ability to not become, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you just kind of get used to the level of danger and you become more cavalier about it, to use a word that somebody did earlier. And I don't think we're going to see stuff like that happening long term, especially if the cruise ships, which were so big on the news about being major sources of coronavirus mm-hmm. outbreaks, if people are still flocking to cruises, there's definitely hope for the rest of us. But cruises yeah. have always had that problem as well, though, haven't they? Yeah. It's, it's not just coronavirus. Pr- prior to that, it's always been some kind of food. Yeah, norovirus. Yeah. Norovirus. Yeah. 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 There's always yeah. something. It's, you know, oh, so a lot of people to, in a, in a so Going back to that Vancouver property, you're talking about part of the percentages and so forth. There was, of course, their cruise market disappeared, and it's a heavy cruise market out of Vancouver. I mean, it is a it is a hub of Van, of of the cruise market is a definable market for Vancouver. Um, that's we've translated that, retranslated that for people that are penned up. We're going to recreate their destination interest in coming to Vancouver, but internalizing it. We're turning them over to Banff. We're turning them into Calgary. We're turning them into the territories. We're turning them into train rides. We're turning them into RVing. Uh, because they still want to see that area of the world. That's what the cruise does. It brings you up the you know the water and you, get, you see Alaska and all this other stuff, Vancouver Isle. Well, you can still get to do this, but you do it from the land side now. And people are going to be interested in small group tours now. They're going to be in you know, low-density stuff. And, and, and really, we targeted people interested that were searching for cruise information from Vancouver and translated that into vacation variations. And they're booking to come in for the fall season. And they were coming from... Our, 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 our programs associated with the cruise travel that we just retooled the, the messaging for. So, you know, you have that demand factor to it. Uh, and then another marketing point that you made about the, the demographics, if, if there's not a better reason to explain why you're offering value add future tense purchases, then, then what you just did, Lily, where you're saying the people that have what they think is winning the lottery, now you're amping up that dollar value by giving them extra bonus value by saying buy a gift card for 100, get 150 for it, or 30% off your fruit future book if you book now, or whatever it is. You do any of those things, you're already amplifying their interest in wanting to do it. And the other people who take advantage of that offer are the opportunistic people that already had enough money that this didn't really hurt hard, you know, you know hurt that bad. But they don't want to go spend for, 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 uh, for, uh, loosely, but they, they, they want to take advantage of a good deal. So you have that middle margin that's probably not going to do much, but you have the fringes that are going to probably take advantage of what we're, you do as early purchase values. So, vacation. So, gentlemen, guys, yeah. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to do one. Unfortunately, uh, I just realised I'm so deep in the conversation. I'm like eight minutes late for my next meeting. No. Uh, You're welcome. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's with Skiff. They've asked me to do an editorial. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hustle sometime. Yeah. You'll be fine. Did you use this as the excuse again, saying, I just got a couple of minutes to talk, and then you take an hour and out of it and half it and say, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I learned from last week. I learned from last week. <laughs> ben, thank you very, very much. I, I'd ask you what you're doing and so forth and so on, but I think you'll tell us in time what uh, – what, uh, uh, Yeah, this week uh, – I, I mean, you can this week you'll be able to find me hiding from my children in this room, uh, trying to get some work done. Uh, who knows where we'll be next week. <laughs> in a different room where the kids will still be in that one looking for you no because there's a lock on this door uh, and they that. can't get in really can't get into this one uh, anyway great conversation guys thank you very much thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. all right bye bye bye, bye. Yeah. Lily, so Lily, Lily, I'm about to make a day real quick. Oh, oh we great. were both going to say something about Lily being happy so about something holy <laughs> smoke okay. go ahead well so so a couple of weeks ago you said I wish there was one of these sentiment studies that really broke down the demographics based on household income. So, as you know, Fuel's done, been doing this bi-weekly um, sentiment study, and we've been getting about 10,000 responses each time. And this last one that we filled in yesterday, which we're, I think we're already over 7,000 responses to, we added the household income breakdown. And so we're going to slice and dice and release the information based on those different brackets. So we'll be able to see if what we're hypothesizing is actually 
what people are telling us. Because we have oh, questions good. about are you going to spend more or less on your vacation this year? Um, things like that that we're talking about. So we'll really be able to see if there is a, a marked difference. That's good because, because Stuart, I was I was looking for something else I could present uh, that's not my work at all uh, to, <laughs> yeah. to sound smart. So I've, yeah. I'm glad you're coming out with something new. Thank God, <laughs> yeah. Stuart, jeez. About <laughs> time. Be, be well, right. Right. We would all be looking funny. <laughs> I guess, Stuart, you're going to need to be a guest on uh, my podcast. Maybe we can record next week. Yes, Lily's podcast, okay. by the way. Yes, but you had to interview this last one, by the way. It's up and running. Podcast number yes. four. Hindsight is twenty twenty, revenue management. And she was also a guest on our podcast. We just actually went live today with that episode. So oh, great! One, episode nice. one forty nine is is now live. Nice! Yay! I was going to throw this up on Lily. I'm glad you're here because when I was going to throw it up on the discussion, you weren't. And this was the humanization of revenue management because literally technology is going to be having to be adaptive next year because the data that's going to be looked at historically is going to be so whacked. <laughs> <laughs> that it's going to take the humanization of understanding the interpretation of it rather than the uh, math that these platforms are going to be trying to extrapolate out of it and so forth. And I know that early on, I mean, this was one of our first conversations back in February, even on the show, where we we're talking about the fact that capture your historical data, retain your, your numbers as to projections that you had before all this happened, because you're going to have to add all those into the hopper next year to try to reinterpret your numbers correctly, to forecast correctly rather than having this skewed year over year, that's what you're going to have if you just go from one set, one data set to the next. So, Yes, uh, and I do want to jump on to that, but I think Ed was going to say something that oh, made me happy, so I want to make sure. It wasn't important. Okay, well, it made me happy. It's important. Um, <laughs> we, had a, we, had a, we had a long discussion on the, the Navis uh, webinar about how, uh, how to argue with your GM not to drop pricing. Oh, perfect. Yes. Well, then and you should listen to Stuart's Fuel uh, podcast where I explain to you why dropping rate actually does create demand. Oh. <laughs> you did a switcheroo. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> number one and number two contradicted. It was great. Hey, guys, yep. I've got to run, unfortunately, but it's Stuart. been a pleasure as always. Always Stuart. a pleasure, my friend. And Stuart, if people yes. need to find you or what you do or your amazing award-winning Winning. podcast. <laughs> FuelTravel.com is the mothership. You can learn all about us there. We're actually going through a redesign, so we should have that up in the next couple of weeks. But, um, yeah, go check out FuelTravel.com. Right now we're running a promotion on our uh, mobile app. You getting a lot of interest on that. So we're we'll waiving all setup fees. You can get the first three months for free if you want digital key, mobile check-in, that kind of stuff. So a lot of folks are taking us up on that offer. So go to FuelTravel.com. Check us out. Also, just to just most, I do get asked what fuel travel in, in the spectrum other than the podcast because people are most familiar with what we do visually, like this and stuff. Yeah, what we do other than the show. Fuel does the podcast, yes. Fuel has an app, yes. But fuel also is. Yeah, well, so we're we're a software marketing software and digital agency. So we we have a bunch of different tools that help you drive direct bookings from a mobile app um, and in direct booking. Uh, booking engine and also a CRM platform, but then we're also a full service digital agency as well. So we can provide uh, customized services for you, ranging from meta search and pay per click to SEO and analytics. So anything you need to drive direct bookings and compete. And your do. booking engine is GDPR compliant, I understand? <laughs> it's GDPR and ADA compliant. Yeah. So, well, I say ADA compliant. That's a, that's a miss. Noma, right? It's WCAG 2.1 compliant, but um, yeah, it's a, a very good mobile friendly booking engine. Kicks the ass of all the guys that you've heard of. Um, so, yeah. You should Is it, it mobile out. friendly or was it mobile first? Because, I mean, it looks more <laughs> like it was designed oh. mobile first. <laughs> you guys, so, you guys are great. But yeah, <laughs> you build, build it from the ground up to be mobile friendly, and almost all of our clients now get more direct bookings from mobile than they do desktop. And, and I don't think if you look at the big boys, they can claim the same things. Um, and right now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, where the world has come to a halt that you should be investing in new technology and switching it out. So check out fueltravel.com if you're interested in doing a better job on the other side of this than you have been in the past. See, we just like dragging you because you're fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I got a hop. So thanks. Have a great weekend. Thanks for your time. <laughs> All right. Really, so, really so, so, Lily, I have to ask you. So, you believe that dropping rate does create demand? 
I do. I also believe you should not drop rate because it does not create demand. Okay, good. <laughs> if you, you if that would one. like to understand how I can be on both sides of that issue, you'll have to do some homework. Oh, Ed so does, because Ed rides both sides of everything. No, no, no. I mean, listen, <laughs> dropping a rate to create demand alone is a tree falling in the woods. You have no understanding what it did. Um, you actually have to promote it, which the actual act of promoting it would then create demand. Uh, but then the question would be, was it the dropped rate that created the demand or promoting the dropped rate that creates demand? Mm -hmm. See, I thought you were going to say, if you dropped rate, would it make a sound? So I got confused. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if a husband says something in the woods, is he still wrong? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. Always. Always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, we had a, but we did have a full, uh, a full, kind of tirade on you know how to argue with your gm that you know dropping rate like this isn't steal demand time right. this is create demand time and you're you know, there are much better ways to create demand than dropping rate and, yes. and to that end too one of the other success points because you were pointing out vancouver 67 percent and so forth was that we keep our rate the most affordable in market period we don't drag it down but we keep at a margin that is the most affordable in anybody that's still in market operating against us that's in the comp um, so that we're perceived as the most affordable. And, and that adds another interest level to us as well, because compatibility of product, we have the same similar products and so forth, but flat out we're at a, at a more affordable rate, but we're not dragging the rate down to the basement either. We're keeping rate within margin of a tiered relationship. So, and we don't normally do, we normally try to be in third or fourth out of a, a tier six uh, but this, this, at this point, we try to keep ourselves margin pretty much about anybody that's still in the market. But we're competing against people or product that we would never have comp competed against before. Full yep. blown boxes in downtown, you know, that were way up here, and they're down in our, our our range. So we played nice and just kept below their line so that they can't take advantage of that that rate drop strategy. Yeah, so. they're trying to steal the demand you found. Right. So that's what they're just, doing. Right. And we're just yeah. not saying, no, you're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gonna have to be faster than that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, a, big, a big key to it is to carry on, it, it, you know, it is to actually carry on with your marketing. Um, you know, there's so many studies out there. I was reading, I was reading one today. Um, I, I forget which one it was. Um, uh, so a, bit, a particular business review where they've, uh, had, yeah, in, in fact, it was it was the Harvard Business Review. I was trying to remember which one it was, but um, they, they've looked at every major crisis um, since the 1970s, um, and, and, the, and the argument is still the same. Whilst there are different industry sectors and there's different nuances in it all, the one um, the, the the companies that positively promote and positive positively market throughout that crisis and throughout that process come out not only. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, as as well as they were before pre-crisis, they actually come out stronger. Yep. Mainly because they're not the ones standing still. If everyone sort of cuts marketing budget, everyone stops. You know, the person that doesn't actually get a, a bigger boost because normally, in, you know, in a buying market, we've got everybody's competing, everybody's got money, everybody's fighting for it. But when everybody steps back and you carry on, and maybe not to the same level, obviously, you know, you, right. you cut your cloth and become a little bit more, as to Lauren's point there, start finding those, you know, the, the, those little gems, those little areas that you really want to work in. That's where you're going to see the big difference. And, and cutting your, you know, cutting, cutting your, uh, your, your room rates, you know, is, is one aspect of it. Yes, absolutely. But might not necessarily be the, uh, the overall strategy that you need to do. Well, and not for the purpose of the conversation, you know, which the ask was, how do I stop my GM from just dropping rate to try and create, uh, you know, demand. And so the answer to that should always be no. Uh, mm -hmm. The answer should instead be, let's see what it takes to get the right mix of demand in and what the right. pricing needs to be along with the spend and investment. Um, you know, because uh, again, I'm using data? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. How weird. That'd be crazy. Well, here's talk. The thing. Actually, I was dying to say it on yesterday's <laughs> webinar because we were talking about, you know, like gut decisions. And I've always hated gut decisions. I've, I've been so against that. Um, I had like the greatest liner and you just opened it up for me. So I'm going to use it here, which is you can't use your gut after it's been just punched because everything <laughs> feels different. Um, I got a question from Ariel on LinkedIn. She's uh, she's. 
Uh, along with rate, I wonder how resort fees plays into the strategy as well. Will the resort fee be more of a deterrent for these for uh, for these like forty five and less HHI guests? They they may be traveling more than the forty five k to sixty k HHI. I don't know what HHI is. I'm I'm not catching the acronym. Oh, on it, but... income, isn't it? Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I just yeah. got it. Yes. Household income. I'm sorry, it probably was an older question. I just I just caught it off of LinkedIn. So it goes back to one of the conversations we were having, Lily, that you mentioned this division between the, the income, the people that got more income, like winning the lottery, and those that were above a certain threshold line of income uh, right. above fifty k. So along with that, I wonder how resort fees plays into the strategy as well. Will the resort fee be more of a deterrent for the 45000 less HHI compared to those traveling that are above the sixty k HHI? What are your thoughts on that? No, because let's be honest, they won't know about the resort fee until they get to your property. Yeah, I think it's, I agree. I think it's going to be more of a guest service feedback issue because there's, yeah. you know, especially if you're going into the lower income brackets, they're not going to be as familiar because they weren't out traveling at resorts previously. They couldn't afford it. So they may be kind of taken aback when they see this show up on their invoice because let's be honest, nobody in any income level really reads small print these days. So, um, thank you, Apple, right. thank you, Microsoft, <laughs> so, Google, Facebook, yeah, Google. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really just going to be, you know, about whether or not they leave nasty TripAdvisor reviews or Google reviews after the fact. So I think that you have to be really careful as somebody who has a facilities fee or a resort fee or whatever you want to call it, city right. maintenance fee, um, that you're not setting yourself up because the worst thing that could happen right now as we're trying to bounce back from this is you get a whole slew of bad reviews. Mm. Yeah. But don't no. you think the um, this this is this is a topic I'm going to bring up with um, uh, a webinar that Ben and I are going to uh, well, hopefully we're going to be on with um, with Kat uh, and Hoa. Um, do, do you think that the the not just the data that we're talking about in terms of revenue and revenue management, but the actual data that we have out there about the whole hotel industry is is going to be potentially almost irrelevant to a certain degree as we move forward. For so 2020, many- yes. And yeah. that also then carries into next year. You have to ignore 2020 behavior for the most part um, because there's so many abnormalities about what's happened. Like there, there are entire audiences that are going to do things they wouldn't do because of being stuck at home. There are entire audiences that are going to do what they wouldn't normally do because of fear for their job, fear for yeah. their health. Yeah. And not all of those are going to be present in the future. I'm not even. I'm not even talking about uh, that that segment there. Um, think of uh, think of the hotel itself. You know, if a hotel is closed and it's furloughed its staff, um, and you've got a very definite need here that you know I'm furloughed and I need to pay bills, pay for my family, and the hotel down the street opens up earlier and they're looking to hire. Am I going to go there before waiting for my own hotel? I think a lot of staff will. Yeah, I think I, a lot of staff will move. So I, I and and the hotel, you know, in TripAdvisor, a lot a lot of your rating isn't the hotel itself; it's the staff, it's the hospitality, right. it's the hospitality industry. We've we've got the great shuffle, and I think that's very part of the topic that we're going to talk about um, uh, 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 on the the webinar. Is the great shuffle, and it's not just in terms of data and revenue; it's also in the people within the industry. Think of it with, uh, with, with with your vendors as well. You know, if you think here, what the vendor that you're once using for your digital marketing, for this, that, and the other, whatever it would be, might not be the same company in six months' time because they furloughed half their staff. Especially in digital marketing, we've got we've got transferable skills. We don't have to work in just the hospitality industry. We can go work elsewhere. Really, you know, quite easily. Yeah, this believe it. Not. <laughs> There is. What have uh, I been doing? Yeah. Zoom is good company for you, Ed. That's what you know. Go. Uh, Actually, I just wish funny. I had invested it's, in it's, Zoom at the end of last year. Right. No, it's, right? it's funny you ask. You 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 make this point because there are a couple of big vendors in the hospitality space that have that were completely crappy to their employees. I'm talking email notification of being yeah. laid off, yes. like just completely ridiculous and i'm paying attention to who they are and who are their best people yeah. because i'm going to go pick all those people off exactly and you're not right. and all i'm going to say is all of my people kept working even though we had the same risk profile as you right and oh no pay cuts uh the owners took pay cuts mm-hmm. yeah we all 
cut our pay. We all cut a lot of our stuff. Um, but our staff, like they've been unaffected by this. Mm -hmm. And, and that is going to be my primary recruiting tool against a lot of the vendors, yep. uh, you know, in that well, are eating for I, this noise as me. I'm going to say very little about that at the moment, given well, I get the circumstances and situation for probably legal reasons. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it's it's Ben and I've been talking about it, and again, we're gonna we're, we're gonna mention it on, on the webinar and explore that in a lot more detail. But it is it's the great shuffle. It is yep. it, it, there, this is going to be a big shuffle, and it's not just your revenue data and your marketing data that's going to change. It's the whole hospitality data. Yep. In my opinion, I could be wrong. I mean, there's going to be large large you know percentage of, uh, of people going back to the same company that they you know, or the same hotel or the same company the same vendor that they once worked with but they're still going to be and the, and it's the question of there is going to be you know the, the likes of, of, of ed and other people that are looking for the best talent and they're moving that from one you know uh, one company to another the hotels the hotels should be looking at the same themselves you know who, who's the best front desk staff yep. who's the best general manager they're on the market right now they really are Mm -hmm. It's very true. Um, did, going back to well, just one marketing aspect, Lily, that you brought up about the progression going forward. But you know, income is one variable, obviously. And there, there and I agree with you completely. There's going to be a gap between those that feel like they won the lottery and those that have uh, not really been hurt financially as hard, and they'll be opportunistic in, in their early travel decisions quite, quite quickly to that. And then we also have those people that have not been able to relax because they've been relied upon so heavily, had who have had and maintained their finances. That once the staffing begins to come back and the need for them has diminished a little bit, they're going to need that relief, that that that, meant that psychic relief of getting out from doing what they've been doing under the pressures of it. Um, those are all definable. I mean, that is one of the pure nice things about our current situation when it comes to technology and capabilities of marketing is we have these tools now we've never had historically to the refinement that they are now of that ability to market by filters and, and segmentations and identifications and so forth and communication channels, the variety of communication channels we have to get our message in front of these people. The, the point of it is, is do you actually have, going back to full circle to what you guys were just talking about, the professional team to do that? Do you have your good marketers, your good revenue managers, your good salespeople that can take those tools, use them, identify the, the segmentations that they need, and then go over and say, boom, this is our game plan. This is, this is play one. Uh, that we're going to do as soon as we see that, that we can put that that game that play in, you know, when we go back to, to playing the game again for this. So um, that that's that whole full circle of that we have these little nuances now that we never had before. So yeah, and there's going to be a lot of companies that are not, are not going to be able to provide the same level of service if it you know if it right. if it outsourced, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be able to provide the same level of service that they once did previously. Right. If they followed half the staff because you know the one person that knew. Or was the you know the linchpin the expert in that particular area is no longer in the company anymore. Yeah, you know? right. So maybe though, if you're in a scenario like that and you have that one person, like let's say somebody chooses to outsource cleaning, right? A lot of companies already outsourced housekeeping. Maybe with all of the new things, they just don't want to take on as much legal stuff. They want to be able to hold a company responsible for their cleanliness. But you still have this one person who knew all the ins and outs of everything in your housekeeping department. Maybe that person does come back and that person becomes the liaison who manages the relationship with the company. You know, if you've got six of those in one department, that's a whole different ballgame and you have to really measure the pros and cons mm -hmm. of things. Um, I don't think that there's any excuse to come back in a scenario like housekeeping, really any scenario with lower service. Uh, then you left just because you've outsourced something. I think it's a matter of managing those relationships properly. And setting uh, expectations. And setting expectations right. and not being afraid to have a conversation with a vendor. I mean, even as a vendor for the hospitality industry, I encourage people to come to me regularly if they're like, hey, this isn't quite working the way that we want it to. Right. Let's look at a different way. It doesn't have to be a, you know, negative conversation it's just a hey let's find a way through this together and and building yeah. partnerships with your vendors if you're not getting what you need from a vendor you need to be telling your vendor you're not getting what you need from them right, the way they react take them yes right the it's way they react tells you if they're a good them. vendor if they're a good right. vendor they will appreciate yes you telling them that they're not meeting your needs because that gives them the ability to be better
if they dodge you or if they tell you you're wrong, that means that vendor does not care about you or your needs. They care about your money only and go find a vendor. Find a new one. Well, yep. Okay, there's even more of an asset test right now. And we and I can share this with Stuart not being here or or, or, or well, hopes of people that are not with us today, Tim and everyone else, is as soon as this started evolving, the first thing we did with all of our clients is the same thing you all did with your clients. How can we help you? You know, uh, you, there were some clients that their hotels were being shut down, others that were being reduced. You know, uh, the workload, as you pointed out, Edward, that, that my workload hasn't gone down, has gone up because yeah. I'm, I'm doing more for my clients now and some of them gratis. Where my logic with them is look at this. You know, I, we, I know what the finances are for you right now. They're the same finances they are for me, but I'd much rather not waste an hour because I can't bill you to do the work than it is let's get the car off the track and pull the engine. This is a great chance to pull the engine. Let's get right. the you know, and do the heavy lifting stuff. And it's not, it's not to bill you later. It's not to even commit to saying they have to re-sign up on a contract or something. It's just saying this is the right thing to do. This is when the good vendors show up and say, how can it is that we can help you? And it's really been a tribute to a lot of vendors we've had on the show where we've been sharing all the, the, the nitty gritty, how we do things. We're not trying to hold back. Well, that's my secret sauce. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't share what we do. We're openly trying to help each other, help all the clients we're connected to those that still can pay those that don't pay. It doesn't make a difference. We're doing everything as, as much as we can for everybody at any time. And that goes for all the people that come on the show for hosting and everything else like this, that we know as vendors, they've been phenomenal. I mean, there's been a collaboration level between good vendors because there's bad vendors. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good vendors. That has been amazing. It's been one of the shining uh, examples that's come out of this this tragedy is this collaboration of, okay, let's work together and figure this out. There's a big ocean out there. We don't. We're not competing with each other anymore. We're helping each other. And if I can know something, I can help your client and vice versa. Then that's what we do. And it's okay. been really neat. It's business leadership, and I, th- I think you can, you can see that. And it's you know, it's not internal business leadership. It's almost like you know, external. How can we how, how can we all help each other? And you and you start. You, I've certainly started to see the cream rise to the top here. There, there's been people who are setting examples, who are you know doing exactly what you said there, Lauren. Um, you know, having those conversations uh, with, with with clients. Um, Knowing that, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's the visitors. The visitors stopped coming to hotels. The money dried up. The hotels didn't want that to happen. It's not their fault. You know, obviously, right. they then, as a business, can't, you know, they, they, that's the cascade effect. It's knocking down. So wherever you are in that chain, whether you're right at the very bottom or right at the very top, you need to be saying, right, what can I do? To, what can I do to help? Or, you know, hotels say to, to vendors, I can't do this, but what, what can we do? How can we work? Because when this flood when this tap does start to come on again, slowly at first, and then open back up again fully, we've all got to be in some situation to be able to be able to move forward, be able right. You know, yeah. to, and to listen, do. I mean, I think about you know, I I spent weeks on the front line for my team, um, you know, helping hotels, you know, broach all of these things, and I look at how we responded, and then we turn to our vendors. Basically saying, hey, we're going to need a break for um, a month or two. What can you do? The ones who responded fairly, not even saying the ones that like helped us or anything, but responded fairly, um, I appreciate it. There were mm-hmm. a couple who didn't, and I will be discontinuing working with them, yep. um, mainly because I, I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to do business with someone who sees me as a source of cash. I hey, want Jay. them. Right. I want to work with partners. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Very true. We, we've said that before. Yeah. Um, well, we're, kind of, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to, yeah. have to drop we're, off. We're literally at the very end of this. And in that sense, yes. to it, I, um, I just was going to throw up the, the rut row, not even the boot, because the boot was just kind of a feel good. Uh, let's look at some pretty pictures. Um, I think uh, Robert was having hard. I think Robert's so much into the groove of finding out numbers that are. You know, they're talking about the Armageddon of destruction of our industry. That he's having a hard time looking at pretty flowers these days, because the boop was kind of a hey, pretty hotels. <laughs> it's like okay, but I'll put the I'll put up the uh, the rut row because we have Oyo has been in the conversation a lot in our show a lot in the historical part part of it, um, and it's just reaffirming this that the the things beginning to unravel. Uh, in lots of different ways. But um, Tris, I know I can't really ask much about what you're doing at the particular time right now, um, hopefully in weeks to come and all, but um, uh, I, I hope that if anybody wants to reach out to you or anything like that, if you want to share any information like that, a little yeah. bit of what you're doing stuff. 
Uh, absolutely. No, I, I, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, again, as, as ever, I'm available on LinkedIn. I'm happy to, uh, to, to, to connect with anyone, um, chat, chat shop, just chat, whatever, whatever it needs to be. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, uh, Ben and I have got a lot of stuff going on in the, in the background and I think hopefully we'll be able to be unleashed on the world. So <laughs> beware. <laughs> evil plans to take yeah. over the world. Yeah, maybe not quite evil. Like yeah. a like a bio layer. Yeah, <laughs> film. Yes, bio <laughs> film. That's it. Bio film. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the the Ben and Tris bio film. Yes. Yeah, what right. Awful thought I've left you with. I'm very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Tris, thank you very much for the time. No, thank you. Thank you as ever, and hopefully I'll see you next week. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, I hope we see you next week as well. Thank you very very much. Bye guys. Um, bye now. So, uh, Lily, if people want to find you and what you do and what your company does and all that and listen to your amazing podcast, where is it they can find you? <laughs> well, I'm Lily Mockerman, so I'm the CEO of Total Customized Revenue Management, which you can find at tcrmservices.com. I'm also the founding partner of Think Up Enterprises, which you can find at thinkupenterprises.com. And between the two, we do excellence in day-to-day revenue management. We focus on profitability, sales revenue, and marketing integration or convergence and profitability. So um, we did just get our PPP loan, so we're hoping to relaunch our complimentary profitability study uh, to the hotel industry so that everybody can come back with a full understanding of their profitability by channel metrics to reconstruct their business. So keep an eye on our social media for that. And we'll let you know as soon as we're ready to go live. And where can they find your podcast? Also at thinkupenterprises.com. And you can click the little podcast link there. Or if you're looking for punishment, <laughs> type it all out. We're still working on that redirect. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ed, sir, if you want to know more about you and Flip2, where is it that they can go, sir? Uh, so to find out about Flip2, you can go to flip.to. I'm the president of the company. We are a advocacy marketing platform. So we help you turn your traveler audiences into members of your marketing to introduce you to new travelers, which has been an incredibly effective strategy during this time uh, where you have to be incredibly sensitive in your marketing. Uh, I highly recommend you go check out our blog. We've been featuring uh, partners of ours that have put up Insane results during COVID-19. Actually, every client of ours that has um, adjusted their campaigns to our suggested uh, positioning are currently running uh, their best um, uh, couple of months on our platform that they've ever had uh, across the board. So you can go to flip.to, check that out, check out our blog. You can find me on social media uh, under Edward St. Ange. And Mr. Lauren Gray, if people want to find out more about you and your alter ego teenage uh, superstar. <laughs> Who I think is trying to buy my domain, laurengray.com, because I'm in- inundated with multiple offers for my domain. <laughs> Yes, I'm just, if maybe the price is right, I might test, but who knows. But, um, uh, well, other than looking at the, po- the post office wall, if you go to the post office, you'll find me. Um, <laughs> you can find this show and all two pre- uh, all previous 246 episodes of uh, This Week in Hospitality Marketing um, at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. Uh, also, there is a podcast that we I do after this as well called Hospitality Marketing, the podcast. And we were doing the episode 247 uh, as a recap of this show, plus some tools and techniques. And a lot shorter than this show is. It's usually around 20 to 25 minutes long the podcast is. Although, uh, Lily, yours was a little longer this week. Yours was in the 40-minute range because you had the interview. So, um, it was. Yeah, we keep between 20 and 40 minutes just depending on the topic. It was good. It was good. I listened to the whole thing, actually, um, as I made it. The things on that stuff, but anyways, uh, so yeah, the, the show for that. Uh, please, um, uh, thank Brian for us again when you talk to him, Ed. Absolutely. It was really insightful and really cool to listen to the hands on. That's the person that does this stuff, not talks about it, not wonders what it's like. He's he's the dude, yep. <laughs> So I hope he gets some business. I, I know that we, uh, when we started this show, we uh, inver- uh accidentally started on Alhoa's uh, Facebook page at the same time. Oh, darn, because I forgot to shut it off. I thought I had actually shut it off, but I caught it uh, yeah also if you uh, care to know all of your comments which i believe were geared towards linkedin posted on our facebook page where you're yeah, they, it, it's an all send on everything on okay. this unfortunately so it does all send uh it was the i first time jumped I over to linkedin and yeah i had to jump on the it 
It doesn't put them on LinkedIn. I had to go back and go, oh, put them on there. Uh, we had a great audience on all the platforms today, actually. Uh, large audiences on the platform today. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of where I think that came from. Uh, but other than the fact that Brian was a great co-host and it was good for, for people to hear him. So, um, But thank you all very much. And for everyone that watched us on all the platforms today, thank you for your time and listening to us. We'll be doing episode number 248 next week, 1130 a.m. Eastern time. I, I do miss Robert. I got to say I miss the little guy. <laughs> <laughs> We all talk a lot more. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, we don't have to share the space. So anyway, with that in mind, thank you everyone for your time and attention today and the privilege of your time. And we'll talk to you all next week, 1130.